Good morning. Uh, today is Wednesday, April 10th, and uh, this is the Education and Culture Committee. Um, Chair uh, Will Juando, joined by my colleague, Councilmember Albernaz. Councilmember Mink will be joining us uh, at hopefully at some point during the meeting. Um, this is, uh, we have three items on the agenda. Uh, it's a big day because we are kicking off our consideration and discussion of the FY25 operating budget request for Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, we'll also have a brief discussion about a recent OLO report on public and private funding sources for schools. Um, and then we will have a what was rescheduled from a previous meeting, a discussion on academic performance and outcome measures. Uh, which So we've got a lot on our agenda. Um, I wanted to start by uh, saying, just since this is the first meeting, we're going to have four meetings uh, on the MCPS operating budget this month. Uh, and then on May 1st, well actually this month into next month, on May 1st, which will be our fourth meeting, uh, we will make a funding recommendation to the full council for MCPS. Um, and obviously we're also going to be considering our friends at Montgomery College and all the other things that we do. But um, this uh, four meetings is the most that I've ever had on the uh, committee uh, and I've, the, in my sixth year. And, and I think I, uh, it's probably the most that's been had. That's a good thing. We're going to get to go into a lot of different topics. Um, we have uh, those agendas will be available where we're going to cover uh, as, as much as we can and get as deep as we can um, in all of those meetings. I know I speak for my colleagues on the committee. Uh, we all care deeply about this school system in this county. Um, we all have school-aged children that have either gone or are going or in MCPS right now. We, all of us, the whole committee ha has attended MCPS uh, as children ourselves. Um, and, you know, uh, this occurred to me the other day, uh, we all represent the diversity of the school system. Uh, between Councilmember Albernaz and me and Councilmember Mink, uh, you know, Councilmember Mink and I, and I asked her if I could say, we're both biracial, white and Asian and white and black and, and, and Hispanic. We represent the whole system uh, as far as the diversity and the majority of stu all the students that are there. Uh, I say that just to say we really care about this. Uh, and so we approach this conversation in these sessions with that in mind. And I know uh, Dr. Felder and uh, President Silvestri and all the team from MCPS and all the other board members, I know we're all trying to swim in the same direction to make sure that our students, our faculty, our staff, our teachers, our parents and community are as strong as they can be. Um, I'm often reminded of uh, when I travel, and I, I know many people have had this feeling, that we're very blessed in Montgomery County. Uh, and, and that's in any a lot of ways, but I think education is top of that list. I, I used to work for uh, a senator from Ohio where they used to have to fight to pass a levy and a bond to fund their local school district um, and if it didn't get funded you didn't have the resources. Um, I've seen other parts of the country where they're literally fighting to teach a inclusive curriculum. We don't have those fights here. We have our own version of fights but they're on a different scale and spectrum. We all believe that everyone should be entitled to education. So while we are going to focus on challenges, opportunities, I think the context of that we are one of the best school systems in the country is important. Uh, we're also a very large system, as you know, and that comes with complexities. Um, uh, I'll never forget that uh, Jerry Weiss used to often say uh, the, the idea that everyone in the school system of this size is going to be having a good day uh, is just not true. So, uh, in, you know, we're, we're large. Um, but so I just wanted to say that at the beginning, and I'll, I'll see if Councilmember Almanaz wants to say anything, because I do think this is a big endeavor. We're coming off of some tough times. We have to re reassure the public and parents and teachers and faculty. You know, Councilmember Almanaz in here, we're, we're, we were here to 1030 last night hearing from educators uh, and your union reps and principals about the dire needs for support for the school system. Uh, I've visited more than two dozen schools since I became chair of this committee, and I've probably visited a hundred since I've been on the committee. Um, and I know the needs are great. I know you know the needs are great. But there's also great things happening in our schools. Um, and uh, our job is to hold both of those things at the same time and make the necessary and difficult decisions 
to support student growth progress for our community. So I'm committed to that. I know our, our committee's committed to that. I know the council's committed to that. Um, and just wanted to start this this day with that. Councilman Arona, do you want to say anything? I'll be brief. I certainly concur with everything that the chair just mentioned and expressing my deepest appreciation and respect to all of you. The, words, the work has never been harder than right now. I know that. We see it. We feel it. Um, but I also have supreme confidence in the dedicated men and women who are working tirelessly seven days a week, 365 days a year on behalf of our children, youth, and families. Uh, we do have an incredible school system and it is the jewel of our and treasure of our entire county. All roads lead to MCPS in Montgomery County. Um, and we know that we have to make sure that you all have the resources that you all need to be successful. That obviously has to be balanced because there are many different ways that this body supports children, youth, and families. And as Chair of Health and Human Services, we have to make sure that our children are fed, that they're housed, that they have the social support that they need, that they have extracurricular activities. And so there are many different ways that the county invests in our children, youth, and families outside of our school system. All of it is important. And we're doing this at a time where the fastest growing demographic in our county is our aging population. Uh, and the wealth gap continues to grow. The challenges that we're seeing nationally um, are we're experiencing here locally. And so I know you all know that. I know our public knows that. Um, but sometimes we tend to focus on what's immediately in front of us as we're having what can be very passionate conversations. Um, but we are all truly on the same team. And that is the vision from which I will be operating from, as I always do, as we talk about the operating budget. And we will uplift and talk about what is working in addition to the challenges. So thank you all. I look forward to these four sessions uh, and digging into the work. Thank you, Councilman Brown. Um, so with that, uh, I think I will turn it over to Board President Silvestri for comments and then Dr. Felder, and then we'll get into the packet. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Jawando, Councilmember Albernos. It's a pleasure to be here with you again this morning um, to discuss this very important topic, which is our budget for MCPS. As you know, their request totals $3.353 billion, which is an increase of $187.9 million, or 5.9% more than the current year's operating budget. Our budget reflects MCPS's strategic plan priorities of academic excellence, professional and operational excellence, as well as our commitment to financial stewardship. I'll first speak about academic excellence. The FY25 budget request supports our critical response to ongoing issues that have impacted our schools, including the pandemic, have impacted teaching and learning, as well as social emotional well-being of our students and staff. As you know, we're doing more in the realm of social emotional well-being than we ever did before. We were fortunate to receive federal funding and a variety of grants to address these critical needs. Examples of the impact this funding has had on our schools includes funding for counselors and social workers, tutoring and summer school programs, wellness initiatives, and operational items such as one-time security enhancements. These funds expire on September 30th, 2024. However, the essential work, which is showing positive impacts on our students, employees, and families, must continue beyond this date. At the, one of the work sessions yesterday, I heard council members say, you know, we can't not see what we saw during the pandemic, especially around the needs of our families and, and mental health issues. Now I'd like to share how the budget supports professional and operational excellence within MCPS. Our request provides competitive salaries and benefits that are fundamental to recruiting and retaining high quality and diverse workforce. This funding supports the second year of our two-year agreements that we reached with our employee associations. Our budget request ensures our valued employees who show up every day for our students have sustainable health care benefits. Employee wellness is incredibly valuable to, individual, to the individual and the organization, and health care benefits are increasingly important factor in employee recruitment and retention, which, as you know, continues to be a struggle locally and nationwide. MCPS is committed to responsible 
financial stewardship. The board's budget request includes necessary inflationary increases in the cost of goods and services across the district. Compared to other of the other largest school districts in the state, MCPS has one of the smallest percentages of resources attributed to central service functions. That means, as I understand it, that we have the second smallest central office of a school system in the state of Maryland. We are using our program evaluation more and more to determine what is working and what is not working to make critical decisions about what we should continue to fund. Approximately 80% of our budget directly supports students' academic success, and the other 20% goes to services that support our schools. To conclude, the Board of Education appreciates the work of MCPS staff and our county partners throughout the budget process. As you said, Council Member Albernos, we are all in this together. We all want the best education for our children in Montgomery County. And we look forward to working with you through these four committee meetings uh, to do the best thing that we can for our students. And now we'll pass it on to Dr. Felder. Thank you. Dr. Felder? Thank you, President Silvestri, and good morning, uh, Chairman Jawando, uh, Councilman Albernos, and uh, Councilwoman uh, Mink. Um, so, and good morning to everyone here today. Uh, we are so grateful to have this opportunity to speak with you about uh, funding for public education here in Montgomery County. So as you know, each day we serve uh, approximately 160,000 students in uh, 211 schools. Uh, to enhance academic achievement, as um, President Silvestri mentioned, 80% uh, of funding goes directly uh, to our schools and 20% supports our operational needs. Uh, we take pride in our evolving uh, demographics of our community and our students, and we prioritize meeting the diverse needs of our students, uh, no matter what their background is, because we know, regardless of their background, that all students can learn and achieve at the highest levels. But we also recognize that teaching children is a people business. We will never, ever, ever be able to put robots and use AI and any other um, to such tool to educate our students. In order to educate our students, we need outstanding, high, highly able, excellent educators or human beings uh, in our classrooms uh, teaching our students. And so we know that as a nation, We've had a, a decline in the number of persons going into the field of education. I um, actually took a look at some research last night by uh, NEA, and as of January, um, since the pandemic, over 500,000 uh, teachers have left the profession. Uh, and the number one reason they cite is their salary. Uh, and so while there are other issues, uh, salary is the number one uh, issue. And so we must continue to attract top talent by offering competitive salaries and benefits um, and supportive environments that make MCPS a destination employer. Uh, the Board of Education, the County Executive, and the Council's commitment to maintaining promised salary increases for, uh, reflects our collective dedication to recruiting and important, more importantly, retaining, this is one thing to get them in, we want to be able to retain them as well, a high quality staff. This plus excellent curriculum materials and programs makes for a vibrant and exciting place for our staff to work, but it does come at a cost. Our recent investments in schools uh, is an investment in student success. This is evident in improved literacy and math performance, uh, which you will hear more about. Um, the improvement from our Chief Operating Operation Officer this morning. It is also evident in numerous students' achievements, such as national rankings of MCPS high schools and scholarships earned by students. Uh, for example, MCPS had five uh, Regenera, I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, science talent search scholars, 13 Questbridge scholars, 16 students who received full tuition 
uh, Posse scholarships, nearly 200 who will receive a Rails O'Neill scholarship next month, and many, many more. Uh, in the Newsweek ranking of American public high schools for 2023, MCPS has five high schools in uh, the United States in the top 500 and eight high schools in Maryland's top 30. Also, one key operating budget initiative has just received national recognition, a 2024 uh, Magna Award uh, for the National School Board Association. Uh, the MCPS social work team uh, has been lauded for their vital work in supporting students, supporting nearly 4,700 students in FY 2024. And they are servicing an even larger caseload this year. So we need to continue uh, the investments and keep the momentum going. Investments in students, staff, and district needs, including resources for the continuing post-pandemic recovery, uh, professional development, operational cost, and meeting the Maryland blueprint requirements are essential for maintaining this excellent school system. Full funding of this budget is crucial for addressing these challenges and pursuing student academic success. This prudent budget does not ask for more than is necessary, but represents what is required and no more. Despite the rising costs of providing education, local pu uh, per pupil funding has been stagnant for more than 20 years. In 2021, per pupil funding locally was $7,139. Today, even adjusting for inflation, the per pupil funding is $7,332. At our best in 2029, I'm sorry, 2009, uh, local per pupil funding was $9,310. So 23 years later, we're not keeping up with the cost of educating our children. Additionally, we know an investment in schools is an investment in Montgomery County. A recent economic analysis demonstrates that significant impact on Montgomery County's economy. This analysis was conducted by Dr. Fuller uh, of George Mason University in September of 2023, uh, showing that MCPS generates $3.68 billion in economic activity annually in the county, and every dollar spent by MCPS in Montgomery County generates $1.45 in county economic activity. So as one of the largest employers in the county, it is important to understand there truly is a return on investment that we make in this school district. So we look forward to the conversation today and to our continued collaboration to build the best operating uh, budget for the best school system in Maryland, uh, Montgomery County Public Schools. Doing so will mean the right programs, the right resources, and yes, highly able educators to ensure our children are learning and are on track for success in college, career, and in life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Felder, really, and President Silvestri for those opening comments. Um, so now we will turn to council staff, to Ms. McGuire, to just go. This is our overview part, so we're going to dig in. And I know colleagues, uh, including myself, will have questions. And, uh, and if anyone, if you hear something related to the overview and you'd like to comment, uh, any of your team, please let, it, let us know. Uh, Ms. McGuire. <clears throat> Thank you. As you said, today is the first of the four uh, H um, no, this is the Ed Committee. I apologize. We will, well, I, I should mention that, though. We will have two yes. EC HHS committees that address things related to education. As Ms. Rowan has mentioned, there are things like linkages to learning and wellness centers that cross over. So, so we will, in total, we'll really have six sessions that touch on it, MCPS. Required. Yes, no, that's absolutely correct. And the first page of your packet um, does outline the uh, the current outline of topics that um, the chair and the committee members have identified to talk about um, at each of these sessions. Of course, this is sort of a structural overline of top outline of topics and. Um, 
things will come up as we go and we can always work in follow up and other issues as needed but this is sort of the current roadmap of where we hope to head over these coming sessions and as you mentioned certainly those uh, joint items with um, health and human services are also ones that um, that engage both agencies and therefore both committees talk about them together in most of those areas there's funding in both agencies Today, of course, again, is uh, the overview uh, presentation of the budget. This really is the budget in very broad strokes, and we'll go through that and, of course, stop for questions uh, along the way or discussion, um, but then dive more into topics um, uh, uh, in the later work sessions. So many, the board's uh, requested budget is attached to your packet, and the executive's recommendation is, a, is attached also. Uh, some of the overview points have been highlighted. The Board of Education did request a total FY25 operating budget of $3.4 billion, which is an increase of 180, nearly 188 million, or 5.9% over the approved FY24 operating budget. That figure for total budget does include all funds, including grants, um, and uh, the tax supported budget which we look at that excludes uh, grants that have specific purposes attached to them and also the enterprise funds the tax supported budget is really the more sort of discretionary spending budget that request is 3.1 billion an increase of 178 million or 6% over the FY 24 approved tax supported budget the county's contribution under the board's request would increase by 162.6 million or 8.2% over the FY24 local contribution. The MOE maintenance of effort requirement, which is the state's required funding minimum, and we'll get a little bit more into that later, but the MOE requirement this year would actually be a decrease um, because of recent years level and slight declines in enrollment that the system has been experiencing. The board does project enrollment to be slightly less than the current school year actual enrollment. Uh, the, the current school year actual enrollment from September of this year is 155 uh, 1,420 students. That figure is the K-12 to figure. Um, Pre-K uh, does of course play a, an increasing role in our system, but for the purposes of um, public school funding through the state, um, we really uh, are looking primarily at enrollment of K-12. to So those are the figures that are cited here. The total figures that you'll see uh, often referred to are of course larger because they do include, uh, again, Pre-K and Head Start and some other um, elements. Last year, the budget process did project um, a significant number of uh, additional students, about 1,500 more students in the current year than were uh, actually experienced, and you'll see some of those fluctuations in the budget figures that we see later on as the system accounts uh, for that actual enrollment experience. On page three of your packet, there's a chart that um, identifies some of the um, major funding breakdown elements of the requested increase. Um, you'll see, of course, the largest amount is uh, $79.5 million for salaries and benefits. Um, there's also $53 million for priority enhancement. I would emphasize that that uh, amount does include um, approximately uh, $33 million and 100 FTE to replace uh, services and elements that have previously been funded by ESSER. And again, we will uh, get more into the federal funding later as well. Um, but just to put some context around those enhancements, many of them would be continuations uh, of elements that have um, been funded through ESSER. And the board's budget adds a net total increase of 268 FTE above the FY24 level. Uh, that would bring us to an FY25 level of 24,764.5 FTE. Again, many of these uh, positions in the net increase are reflective of shifts from ESSER. Uh, and so again, some of those are not technically new positions to the system, but they are new to the tax supported budget. <clears throat> The county executive's recommendation uh, does include a, is, is lower than the uh, board's request. The county executive recommends a total FY25 operating budget for MCPS of three, nearly $3.3 billion, an increase of $127.8 million or 4% above the approved FY24 level. In total numbers, the executive's recommendation is $60 million less than the board's requested budget. I would like to note, however, that 4.4 of that difference relates to a technical adjustment related to bus camera revenue. It's not impactful. Um, uh, so really, the more um, 
uh, noteworthy uh, difference is the 55.7 million uh, difference in the county contribution. So the executive's recommended county contribution is 55.7 million less than the board's requested county contribution, and that's really where the true difference lies uh, between the two budget recommendations. And just on that point, Ms. McGuire, I think I'm going to for the millions watching at home that I'd like to say, and I, and I appreciate Grace Rivera Oven being here from the board. I know there's other board members that watch, so hello to all of you. Um, the county executive's request, unlike the superintendent's or the board's request, doesn't go into specificity about where you're supposed to find that money. And I just want to make that point to the public. Is, um, is that, that's correct, right? That is correct. Yeah. He, he has provided um, uh, some more context in his budget document yeah. than in previous years, but certainly not to that level of specificity. Right. Okay, thank you. Please continue. The county executive's budget does also um, make a note, and you'll see, again, a, um, a replication of his chart on the top of page four of your packet. The executive's budget does make a note of some of the other um, funding in the county budget that directly supports the school system but is not in the school system's budget. Most notable uh, in that list is, of course, debt service on school construction bonds, um, which is uh, a, a large number. Uh, we do a lot of school construction. Um, also, uh, funding for pre Prefunding for retiree health benefits, um, the TechMod uh, project, which is in the CIP, and which, of course, again, we'll talk about in, a, in another meeting, uh, and some support services in other um, areas, many of which, again, the Ed Committee will talk about jointly with the HHS Committee, um, again, in those that, that touch both agencies. So uh, just to spend a moment on maintenance of effort, again, this is the Maryland law that sets a minimum funding level for public education. It do, the Maryland law does require local jurisdictions to fund school systems at the same amount per pupil as the prior year, or above, of course, but not below the same amount per pupil. So funding then for school systems can increase under the law, would increase or decrease only relative to changes in enrollment. Again, systems always can go above uh, maintenance of effort, and certainly the county has uh, in a number of years. Um, the law has gone through a number of changes. First, uh, post the recession, uh, the Great Recession in 2008 and fiscal years 10 through 13, and then subsequently during the pandemic uh, experience when, of course, there was significant disruption um, to, to pretty much everything. Uh, and so at any rate, the law at this point requires um, jurisdictions to fund school systems uh, based on enrollment, the higher either of the current actual enrollment or of the three years prior average. And in many cases, that does allow for some smoothing and fluctuations um, but again um, because of the recent experience in in enrollment in MCPS it would be um, a decrease required in the level of funding of nearly 26 million I don't think anyone really expects that that's where we're headed um, but just pointing it out again from a legal and a requirement standpoint if the executives recommended 106.7 million dollar increase in the county contribution is approved the FY 25 per people amount would increase increase to $13,611 per pupil as the new MOE required level going forward. Um, because again, uh, whatever the actual funding level approved by the system, I mean, sorry, by the, by the local jurisdiction, that becomes the new per pupil base for the following year. Um, and, and let me know if you have anything on any of this. Um, so let's talk about the per pupil number just for a second, because we heard presentation, obviously, and I just want to make sure, again, I want to make sure it's very clear what we're talking about here when people hear different numbers. Mm -hmm. So the 13,611 are real dollars today. Um, the number that Dr. Felder mentioned uh, is an inflation adjusted number, which is just over half of that. So could you just, could we, mm -hmm. let's talk about that for a second, about sure. what that means. Sure, absolutely. And actually it might be helpful to jump a little bit ahead for a moment. I do have a table that's on the bottom of page five and the top of page six that shows the funding amounts over maintenance of effort um, since FY18. Um, maintenance of effort, and I, I should have clarified this, maintenance of effort only counts new local dollars. So one um, factor about maintenance of effort is that, again, it's, it doesn't count how much state or federal or other kinds of aid there is. It only counts new local dollars. So for example, um, 
and that's just the law. So for example, all of the ESSER funding that came in. If you look at, um, the, and the school system does have in their budget also a chart that shows the per pupil funding just divided by the total budget, um, which, would, which again shows sort of its own story of fluctuations, because certainly the system's had fluctuations in every uh, funding source over the years. Um, but that would again show a sort of a different picture of what that whole pie looks like. And so the per pupil requirement is reset every year. It's, it's really a division of the appropriation of local dollars divided by enrollment, and that is the per pupil requirement for the next year. Um, the, the chart on, again, pages five and six does show that certainly there were some years, particularly during the pandemic, where the amount over maintenance of effort was um, not very high over maintenance of effort. But it also shows that in FY 23 and 24, certainly the council approved significant increases over maintenance of effort. And even under the CE's recommendation this year would again be the second highest uh, in, in a large number of years. Um, so again, sometimes I think what that would show as an impact ultimately on, on the um, inflation adjusted trends that the superintendent was referring to certainly would begin to show a change uh, in that direction. But the, the per pupil <coughs> under maintenance of effort is always a portion. Yeah. Um, and uh, what we also see is that typically the amount of county funding as a proportion of the whole budget has remained fairly constant. Uh, it's, it's typically about 63 to 64% of the budget that of the total MCPS so budget. So our county contribution to the MCPS budget has remained fairly constant as a percentage of our budget. So as a percent of the school system. As a school budget. system budget. As a percent yes. of the schools. Right. It actually also has remained fairly constant as a percent of the total county yeah, the other budget. Would be true too. Right, yeah. right around uh, half or a little better than half. Um, but the uh, proportion of the school's budget the county funding as a proportion of the school's budget has remained fairly constant somewhere between 63-65% for a number of years. Right. And so the, the, the issue of the 7,000 number versus the 9,000, so to get the 9,000 number back in 2009 or 4, I think it was 2009. That's also an inflation number. That's an inflation those number. Are, those are well. also, so, everything yeah. from 2001, those are inflation right. adjusted dollars. Adjusted dollars for inflation. So obviously that matters because, you know, I, I can't think about how many times we've been here talking about the cost of this, cost that, everything costs more. Um, you know, we had some news this morning that inflation stubbornly ticked up a little bit, um, so could, which could delay interest rates coming down again. Um, so just important for folks to understand the context. Uh, you know, I do think the county has uh, supported education, as was mentioned. It is half of our budget, um, just just under. And uh, but the size of the school system has changed. The needs have changed. Uh, the cost of things has changed. Uh, and so we're in a context of of all of that happening at the same time. So it's just important for folks to realize that. So. Please continue. I know I took your head. Now you can go back. That's all right. We don't have to go very far back. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, no, I appreciate that context. Um, uh, the top of page five. Um, again, this really does just discuss the the context that we were discussing. Um, there's a chart on the top of page five of your packet that shows all of the major revenue sources grouped together. Um, and again, what you what you'll see is that um, typically the uh, state aid makes up approximately 30 percent of the MCPS budget. The county uh, makes up again somewhere in the neighborhood of 63, 64 percent of the MCPS budget, and then um, other uh, funding sources sort of fill in that um, that remainder. Um, the federal grants being uh, probably the si most significant part of the remainder. Enterprise funds are those funds um, where the revenue comes in and expenses are based on that revenue, such as the food services fund. Um, so that's why those are held a little separately, again, because they're not, um, they're not fungible dollars. The table in the middle of page five also does show the percent increases in the MCPS budget in recent years. And as we were saying, and as the chart we were looking at for maintenance of effort shows, certainly there were a number of years where the budgets were more constrained, um, although at that time they were also supported um, through some additional federal dollars and the relief dollars. But the, um, the last uh, 
two years in particular uh, have seen significant increases in the MCPS budget. The table in the middle of page five does uh, outline both the cha percent change in the county contribution as well as the tax supported budget as a whole. Um, if you look at FY23 to FY24 approved, there was an 8.5% increase in the county contribution. And the county executive's recommendation uh, for the one-year change, FY24 to 25, would be a 5.4% increase. But if you look at the two years together, even the county executive's recommendation, which again is lower than the board requested, would be a 14.3% increase over the two-year period. And again, as we just reviewed the history of the MOE funding, certainly um, recent years have seen some of the largest increases in quite a number of years in the amount of funding over the maintenance of effort uh, requirement. So, yep. did you? No, just uh, appreciate that, yeah, and that's on the five to four. You know, obviously <laughs> we had FY20 and 21 and 22. I was here for those. They were very same services budgets. We didn't have a lot of increases. Obviously, the federal government came in and helped in in a big way. Um, you know, hundreds of I think you know just under over two hundred million dollars that we had in the county generally. Not all of that, and then obviously MCPS was able to apply. And I don't remember. I know we'll talk about ESSER, um, but uh, good context to have. So I do want to uh, take a couple moments to talk about the MCPS fund balance discussion um, as well as uh, spend a little time with uh, the most recent financial report. So when we talk about the MCPS fund balance, there are a number of funds. We're talking about the Employee Benefit Fund. Uh, there are some other assigned funds. But generally, the operating budget conversation around MCPS fund balance consists of un unspent appropriated uh, fund balance in the school system's tax-supported operating budget. That's really what we're, we're talking about in this particular conversation. And the school system, um, by just by definition and good budgeting, will end each year with some sort of fund balance because the state law requires that the school system not end in a deficit. And in order to not end in a deficit, you're going to end in a surplus. Um, certainly, there have been um, a number of factors and changes uh, related to fund balance over the years. Um, the state law does require that once funds are appropriated to the school system, they can't be used for any other purpose. However, at the end of a fiscal year, uh, what is in the fund balance can't be accessed by MCPS until the council reappropriates it. So we always, of course, keep track of that and then again decide how and when to appropriate that for the use of the school system. Typically, the practice has been for a number of years that any um, reasonable amount of, of excess fund balance can be reappropriated as a resource for the next year or as we've seen in recent years can be used for supplemental needs during the school year. Last year in FY24 operating budget discussions, the council did identify, and as you see in the chart on uh, page six of your packet, that for a significant number of years since FY19, there had been a continued uh, level of fund balance at approximately $25 million that had been carried over uh, year to year, uh, both as a budget assumption and then as an unspent amount. Um, the Council's reserve policy does state that there should not be a budgeted reserve in the MCPS budget. While MCPS will, of course, end every year uh, with a fund balance, as we've just discussed, the Council did determine that because of the fiscal conditions last year, primarily because of the proposed tax increase, that it was necessary to relook at the assumptions and the practice of intentionally carrying over a significant amount of funding that is outside of this Council's fiscal policy. And that really was the core of the discussion. Certainly, the Council supports prudent budgeting, as I know the school system does as well, and anticipates that there will be surplus funds at the end of the year. <clears throat> However, the council did determine that, again, in an effort to mitigate and reduce the level of impact of the found balance, uh, I'm sorry, of the tax increase as much as possible, to remove that assumption of an intentional carryover amount of the $25 million. So the only difference in the, in the budget uh, framework that we have going into FY25 is that that, um, that amount is not assumed as a budgeted fund balance assumption in the budget framework. 
The other um, assumptions about savings still, of course, hold true. The school system actually has implemented uh, expenditure restrictions, as the committee discussed in February, in order to achieve savings to support the employee benefit fund. The council appropriated uh, some of the unappropriated fund balance um, that had been accrued to support the employee benefit fund. Those are all very appropriate fiscal management tools, and that's really what the fund balance is ultimately. Um, but again, uh, the piece that has changed is that framework. So the board's request for FY25 does not include any assumed fund balance. At the same time, certainly they have some, because again, that's, uh, that's just responsible budgeting. Um, and right now, the projection would be that at the beginning of uh, FY25 or July 1st of 24, the school system is currently projecting uh, a fund balance of $14.8 million. If there is an identified need or reason to appropriate those dollars, certainly that could occur. I'll pause there before I go into the financial report. No, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Squire. And uh, we had a lot of discussion about this over many years, and I, I appreciate Rob and, and team uh, and the board for not assuming that in your request. Uh, we had, we went, the committee had moved forward and the full council agreed to remove that funding uh, as part and to count that towards you know uh, the use of the overall budget in uh, last year and so really appreciate that and as Ms. McGuire said it's of course you're going to need to have some fund balance of course we're always going to be here <laughs> you know like to, to back you up as well and so um, I don't know if you have any comments on on any of this or um, just a, a, I guess, a quick comment. Sure. Uh, we had, we had talked about the twenty-five thousand or twenty-five million as being part of a savings plan, and that's how it originally um, started. Yeah. Um, so, in essence, what we've been operating is without a, a savings account. And if you look at the data, more than half of our country doesn't have a savings account. The problem comes when there's inflation exceeds what we projected. Um, but as, as Ms. McGuire noted, uh, we did institute an expenditure restriction plan um, to try to make sure that we don't go negative. So that's kind of the different uh, way we're operating you're this year. you're approaching yeah. it. I, pr I appreciate that. Sure. And, uh, I, know it's, I know it's not exactly what you'd like, but thank you for li being good partners. Um, go ahead, Ms. McGuire. So certainly um, one important element of the committee's uh, overview uh, every year with the operating budget is to look at the most recent financial report. The school system produces monthly financial reports and presents them to the Board of Education and of course the committee takes them up several times a year as well. Most recently we did discuss this in February. Uh, the board's request, I'm sorry, the latest monthly financial report presented to the Board of Education um, again reflects um, some of the expenditure restrictions that we've been discussing but the, they do reflect conditions as of the end of January. There's always a lag so um, we would anticipate seeing again um, the further impact of those expenditure restrictions and further savings as the year progresses. The table uh, on page 8 of your packet does show the expenditure status um, by each state funding category. The March 19th report does identify a deficit in four categories. One is instructional salaries, special education, student personnel services, and operation of plant and equipment. The report cites lower than anticipated lapse in turnover experience as the primary reason for these deficits. And again, certainly I think that's an area where making this adjustment in the approach to uh, fund balance and the approach to those expenditures certainly may take some fine tuning, and I appreciate that. And, and lapse in turnover is an area that we'll dive into more uh, in one of the later work sessions and have some more discussion about. So I think part of what we might be seeing here is again some of that adjustment in the system this year uh, to those different practices as Mr. Riley was discussing. Uh, the category 10 deficit is much uh, larger uh, than, than the other ones as cited and the system did indicate that some of the inclement weather costs are part of the um, rush or part of the reason that that is being accrued. Nonetheless the entire budget certainly still is uh, in uh, is in is in surplus, uh, which is again the state's requirement. And what is the practice when you have these negative areas? You know, for example, the operation and plant equipment or the instructional salaries. What 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 do you do? So internally, um, you know, we look on we look at our expenditures on a daily basis. But when a department or a division knows that they're going to be over. Um, they kind of project what that overage is going to be. They send a letter to our office, um, just so we're aware of it. And then we start the process of determining how we're going to um, 
what we're going to do about that negative variant. So we've, we've done that process through Category 12. Um, and as you can see, there, um, Category 4 and 5, we have surpluses there. Um, so then, as Mr. McGuire mentioned, we, we can't be negative at the end of the year. So we have to plan that once we know any particular category is going to be negative. And then you move it, you adjust accordingly. So, so we do, so the county affords us the opportunity to do that at the end of the year. We right. do a category transfer at the end, right. which is uh, we are grateful for because that's that's the way we. Uh, that's the way you balance the book. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And that is again, you know, the the reason for the committee and the council reviewing, reviewing the these is yeah. to have an anticipation of what those categorical transfers might be, and to have that understanding. Certainly, if there was a more significant concern about the approach or the overall, then these would be the opportunities to work that out in advance. Um, but again, what we see is that years worth of monitoring reflected in the final year end transfer that comes uh, following these conversations. And on the freeze, uh, you know, we hear a lot about the freeze from principals and educators and having to submit the, uh, you know, the exception for, for certain things. I know that typically happens at some point during every year, uh, but in the, we had discussed this a little bit, uh, that this year it, it seemed to, to, at least to some, to happen sooner. Um, is that correct, or, or did it, or was this? Nor, and what were, if so, what were the reasons behind that, and how do you see that going forward into next year? Yeah. So, so normally in the past few years, as as you mentioned, we we've been closing the books a little earlier, meaning sometime in April. Um, this year, because of that, uh, because of our employee benefit plan, uh, we projected that's going to be in in the red, in negative by the end of this year. We had to institute that expenditure restriction that started in January. Right. Um, so we've instituted the process where. Um, if it's a critical need or if it's for um, the critical needs of students in this current year, we have a process where we can um, grant exceptions. Um, so that, that's been the process going forward. And is that through your office? Yes. It, well, uh, we have the, the expenditure restriction committee is made up of different offices, but uh, um, it, it goes through us and then through the chief operating officer. Through, through Mr. Hall's office. Okay. Yes. Well, that's something we can come back to, but uh, it's something we hear a lot about. Absolutely. I'm sure you do. Yeah. Go ahead, continue. So transitioning then to discuss state aid, uh, MCPS did receive a total allocation of $971.4 million in state aid for FY25. That is an increase of $38.1 million over the approved FY24 state level. Uh, so that's certainly good news. Uh, the superintendent's uh, budget initially had had assumed an estimated increase in state aid of only $10 million, and so as a result, the Board of Education was able to uh, take account of that additional $28 million of state revenue. I will say it is very, very, very challenging to accurately predict state aid. Um, and so uh, the, the initial assumptions almost invariably change with the board's budget. That's not any uh, kind of critical statement one way or the other. Sometimes we have good news, sometimes we have bad news. Um, but the, one of the reasons that it is so difficult to estimate is that on the one hand, there's enrollment changes, which are more knowable, but the primary driver um, in, in how much state aid we get in addition to our enrollment really is the wealth equalization formula at the state. And so the state aid um, is adjusted by the relative wealth among counties. So while we sort of know generally what our own wealth calculations might be, uh, for a, from a state aid perspective, they are relatively adjusted by the state relative to how other counties are doing. And again, that that is one piece that is just um, very hard to predict year to year. And so we really do have to wait for those final numbers to come out for the board's budget to know. So the superintendent's budget is always a, a best estimate based on enrollment. The board's budget um, does actually, uh, in acknowledging this additional uh, state aid that came, the board's budget did uh, take a $3 million decrease in the local contribution and so gave the county uh, $3 million benefit of that state aid. Um, and then really uh, the bulk of that additional aid uh, was identified as to as additional funds to support the employee benefits plan. Now I know we've had a lot of um, discussion here already this morning about the employee benefits plan. Again, the committee did discuss this at the end of February, and we'll come back with more specifics on the April 29th meeting to talk more fully about it there. Um, and at that time too, we'll be able to have uh, some of the uh, cross-agency context that will be available from the government operations and fiscal policy committee's discussion of benefits across all agencies. So we'll have that come back uh, there. But that was the single largest um, uh, allocation that the board made of the new revenue. 
Uh, there is fuller description of the changes in state revenue in the board memorandum. I just would note briefly that um, state aid to MCPS increased primarily in the foundation grant and in the funds associated with English language learners and students with disabilities. Again, certainly those are areas where uh, the growth in our student population there did um, bring additional funding. Uh, and again, as we've pointed out, uh, the enrollment used to calculate the state aid formulas did decrease slightly in the current year. Um, and MCPS does rank 19th out of the 24 districts currently in terms of change in student enrollment. Blueprint funding uh, increased by nearly $5 million from FY24. Uh, this amount reflects both uh, unrestricted funds, which again can be used for any purpose, but more significantly uh, some restricted grant funding that goes for specific purposes. Uh, MCPS does rank 20th out of the 24 jurisdictions in blueprint funding per student, again largely due to the wealth uh, equalization. There is a, a table at the top of page 9 of your packet that outlines the areas uh, of the blueprint funding and MCPS's allocation from the state in each of those areas. You'll see that most of them did experience a decrease. Um, our largest increase in categories came in the concentration of poverty grant from the, from the blueprint funding, and a great deal of that is related to community schools, which again we'll talk more about in a, in a future work session. I also would just note that, of course, I think folks are aware the governor did uh, allocate and the General Assembly did support some additional funding for public education across the state. Uh, I don't believe we have the final, final numbers, um, but MCPS's, uh, our initial uh, allocation from the state appears to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $780,000, uh, so certainly we can make a note of whatever the actual final number is as we uh, reconcile revenues at the end. We'll always take more state aid. Uh, I'll note, you know, there's been a continual discussion about the wealth equalization, and uh, you know, we have nearly half of our students on free and reduced lunch. The way it's calculated it does not benefit us, uh, or it has not always benefited us as as as, as much as it could. Uh, but obviously, those are conversations that we need to continue to have with. Our delegation and state partners um, and and we want to have those I think it's something you know that uh, needs to be folks in Annapolis need to be constantly reminded our delegation knows but others don't know particularly if you look at our ever farms rate you're over 50 percent right you know right there so thank you Mr. Warren so we'll, oh, Okay, we'll switch gears yet again uh, to discuss the federal COVID-19 relief funding, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, uh, also known as the ESSER funds. Um, during the pandemic, as we've discussed, MCPS did receive significant federal funding to support the many extraordinary needs uh, presented by the COVID-19 efforts, as well as efforts to recover uh, from, from that experience. MCPS received three ESSER grants. Uh, the first ended in September of 2022, the second ended in September of 2023, and the largest, ESSER 3, will end on September of this year, 2024. And so fiscal 24 is really the last fiscal year that benefits from the ESSER funding, and certainly the committee uh, and the school system have uh, discussed this leading up till now, um, as, as we certainly had um, that, that knowledge. The, there is a table uh, on Circle 78 of your packet that shows the allocations for the final ESSER um, uh, grant allocations uh, that the, I'm sorry, the final expenditure the expenditure summary of the allocations for the final ESSER grant, thank you, and their current uh, encumbrance and expenditure st uh, state. Um, what we will, again, we will come back more fully to uh, discuss the elements that are proposed to be recommended um, that are proposed to be replaced by the general fund of the ESSER elements. We'll come back to discuss those more fully. Um, council staff did compile the table that's on page 10 of your packet. Um, it was based on sort of the, the documentation in, in, in some of the early uh, budget documents. These were the elements that were identified as being um, carried forward from ESSER to the general fund. Um, and so we just summarize these briefly here. Again, we'll, we'll do a more um, thorough crosswalk uh, in a future work session. I would just note that many of the elements that are here in this table to be replaced uh, do replace 
mental health supports, other social service supports, student wellness, um, and, and other, again, social service supports that were increased during the pandemic. And certainly that was a critical need, uh, it was all hands on deck and everyone in, in most of the agencies in the, in the government and certainly the school system uh, stepped into that space to really support our students and families um, and certainly want to acknowledge that those needs have not gone away and that those needs continue and uh, remain a critical area of concern. It may however be a good opportunity and a, and a need to discuss more fully across agencies and departments how is that infrastructure structured, how is it resourced, what is the appropriate um, ecosystem and a network what agencies can best leverage uh, those resources and and their um, their their missions to support that in a way that again creates a very coherent infrastructure and this just may be the beginning of that conversation again particularly as we look at the elements here and where else we see supports um, for those elements in other agencies or per, again perhaps just what are the relative roles and strengths of each, each agencies each agency and department in stepping into that space. I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, it will be an ongoing discussion. I think that undergirds, obviously we're gonna get into this these items specifically in a later work session. We will talk about a lot of the related mental health and social well-being items in the joint HHS EC. Obviously we heard a lot of testimony over the last several days about adding, adding linkages to learning to certain schools, uh, at, you know, for keeping the restorative justice and the social workers, you know, many things that are on this list. We had a lot of testimony from community members. So there's no doubt, I don't think anyone would question the need. The question is, which is a good question, what's the best way to deliver those services? Um, who's best positioned? How do we build upon successes? Um, how do you braid the funding appropriately? Um, and that is all, uh, you know, you, you don't solve that in one budget, but uh, you set the direction for it. Um, and certainly the school board took a position uh, that I think is a totally reasonable position that we, you know, these people are here working and we need them, we need them to stay. Um, and, uh, but it is something and it's good, good that Councilman Robertize and I are the, uh, both he's, he's the chair of HHS and I'm chair of education. He's on this committee and Councilman Mink. And I think you have, uh, we, we can do our part to help contribute to that conversation because these needs are not going away um, and uh, our kids are dealing with things that uh, none of us had to deal with. The more you see about the impact of social media and uh, online bullying, I mean it just it gets worse. You know, We knew it was bad but the, the data and research is coming out just shows how, how bad it, it, it really is. So I um, appreciate you mentioning that. It is an important, it's going to be something I think we're dealing with for the next several years but we should intentionally talk about it um, because obviously there are advantages sometimes uh, to having some of these resources go to other county government agencies but, um, uh, but there also might there are very good reasons to have MCPS be the lead on some of these so we just need to I'm mentioning that I see you nodding I think that's something we just need to be cognizant of as we go forward so thank you for mentioning that let's continue okay um, so just really briefly touch on uh, some of the other uh, elements of expenditure uh, increases and decreases in the in the budget. Um, again, we will come back uh, also to discuss uh, the um, other priority enhancements that were, were that were not related to ESSER. Um, there were a number of changes uh, over the course of all these different budget documents, and so we'll bring a more. Uh, um, be sure that we have the most updated information for you in a future work session. But some of the increases that were not directly associated with ESSER, um, I just highlighted some of them here on page 11. Again, this is not a complete list. Um, Pre-K expansion, again, of course, is uh, is up there. There were investments um, in some of the systemic uh, discussions that have been we've been having around human resources and other employee um, uh, services. Uh, instrumental music uh, certainly was was a, an area of highlight um, as well as um, shoring up the career pathways, the language line, and some of the security enhancements. Um, so again, we'll come back to those, but just to highlight some of the areas that uh, received specific attention uh, for increases this year. 
In addition to increases, of course, MCPS annual re annually reviews the operating budget to determine where um, re reductions and realignments or savings can um, be, be helpful to free up resources within the budget. And this year, MCPS identified 15 million and 56.7 FTE as reductions across the system. Um, again, I know there was a lot of movement between the different budget documents, so we'll be sure that that's the most accurate number as well, because the board also made some changes uh, that we'll, we'll need to be sure are reflected. We mentioned briefly uh, that the board um, I'm sorry, that the MCPS does calculate the continuing salaries, which is really the, the amount that's needed to continue the salaries at the negotiated uh, level uh, into the next year. And that uh, amount for FY25 is $79.5 million, and as we've discussed, there's an additional $41.8 million that really is uh, dedicated to some of the structural issues around benefits, which again we'll return to following the Government and Operations Committee's discussion. Um, in terms of positions, uh, one of my favorite budget tables is Table 5, which shows all of the positions in the system uh, classified according to um, position type. And I have uh, recreated some of that uh, table on page 12 of your packet, really just showing the actuals uh, in those position categories from FY23, 24, and then of course the changes going into 25. Um, what you see here are that the largest growth areas are in uh, instructional supports, as well as the psychologist and social worker positions. I would again just note that some of those increases that you're seeing do relate to those shifts from ESSER. So the net increase this year is a, a little dif little different to parse than, than usual because we do have that shift of items that are not new functions but new to the general fund. Um, and you also will see that some of the um, positions most closely tied to enrollment are experiencing either slight fluctuations down or uh, just reflecting again that slower pace of enrollment. The final section of the packet. Yes, uh, hold on one oh, second. I'm sorry. I think Councilman Mink has a question. I'll remind people that the nearly 25,000 staff at MCPS is larger than probably 20,000 cities in the U.S., <laughs> so just to give the context of the operation here. Uh, Councilman Mink. So, clarifying question about the chart. Um, so, for positions that were moved from ESSER funding off of ESSER funding, those are reflected in additional positions here. This is not a net, or it isn't? The, the FY24 to 25 change is net. Okay. The 25 total would reflect that, like the 25 total is also a net, but it reflects that, um, those additions. Okay. And, we, and when we get further into the ESSER, we can certainly itemize more uh, which positions are being carried over. You can see that a little bit in the summary table that, um, that is on page 10 um, in terms of just numbers of FTE, but it doesn't give quite the same level of category. Again, we'll try to bring back some details on that. So the FY20... 324 does not have ESSER. Does not have ESSER. Okay, so in terms of how many of these folks, for example, looking at um, you know instructional positions, uh, were actually more people in the schools, we can't tell that from this chart, right? Or are those? I believe that's accurate. I'm just double checking. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, I'm just trying to discern whether. Um, uh, if ESSER if ESSER supported positions are not in the chart under the F on the FY twenty three and FY twenty four columns because right. they, that then somebody looking at this can't actually tell the additional number of bodies that there may or may That's not be in schools. Is that accurate? This correct. Yeah. Okay. That I mean that would be what I what I want to know also. So it'd be as we continue to work on this, it'd be great to have that breakdown. And I think. Uh, Yes, we, so we will. We can bring that breakdown back. The ESSER chart of expenditures um, did have the FTE associated with it, mm -hmm. but again, not in this category. Right. So right. To right. be able to break down the numbers yes. of so right. this is like this is county supported positions it's, essentially. It's right. everything that's non ESSER. Right. Fair. As ESSER was as the county also with federal relief funds, they they were just accounted for a little differently. This this table does include all other funding sources. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in some categories, then, right, theoretically, it could be like if we're losing a bunch of ESSER positions, but we're adding a couple that aren't funded, but, like, there could there could be a decrease in some categories that looks like an increase. Um, well, but that, but the, the 20, 25 does include the ESSER shift. Does include it. So, so, so 25 would show what's being added. 
Yeah. Right. Social workers is a good example. Yeah. Right. So the 81 versus the 50 that shows th that would be everything that's being shifted onto the general fund. So 25, like the net increase mm -hmm. would, sh would show, but it doesn't show the comparison with, with who was there before that right. wasn't. Right. Like that change yeah. in 31, those 31 people might have been there, right, in FY24? Yes, and we'll, that okay. crosswalk I do hope to have more right. when we bring back the SF yeah. funds. So a funding shift. This is about funding shifts, potentially, yes. for some of us as opposed to... Correct. Pe yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. Brian looks like he wants to say something. Mr. Wilson. Just a moment of, uh, uh, please, a point of clarity, if I may. Um, yeah, the <laughs> table on the top of page 11, um, we have salaries and benefits for 79.5 million. Um, that actually really just represents um, the salary piece. The EBP, um, the employee benefits plan, a little bit further down there, 41.8 million, is the um, increase in health care, which of course is also part of the negotiated agreements. And so I just want to be clear because there seems to be some confusion, but the overall uh, em uh, employee benefit package, salaries and benefits included, is about a $120 million increase. Yeah. And I, I think there, I think too, there are maybe a couple of different sections of the benefits because I think it's the associated benefits with the negotiated increases, perhaps because the the board's table does show that seventy nine point five is including some of the benefit costs, but clearly not anything related to the EBP plan. Right. So the um, the seventy nine point five would include uh, increases in benefits related to the pay increases. So when pay goes up, the benefits also go up, um, like the contributions EBP. to. Mm -hmm. Healthcare plans, right? And so the forty-one million is really representing the increased cost of healthcare. So back right. in November during open enrollment, we passed on a nine percent uh, increase to all of our employees across the system. Um, the systems portion of that nine percent increase is represented in the forty-one million dollars. Yeah, right. So yeah, they're, they're different things in there, but together they they encompass the salaries and benefits that for employees. So it is. I do think that's important to note that. Um, and maybe even in a future chart, we put them together, you know, closer together, just so that you know, like it's those are related to what employees are the benefits that they're receiving. But I appreciate you pointing that out. Are you done? Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, Councilor Alvarez mentioned to me the vacancies. Um, I, are you going to? We'll come back to that. We're going to come back to that. Yes, I don't have that information. We don't for have today. it today, but we will talk about it. It's when you talk about positions, you always want to talk about. It. Sorry, but no, it's okay. No, but we're, it, we, the suspense will build, yeah. <laughs> and, and we will, we will, we will discuss it. Ms. McGuire, please continue. So the final section of the packet uh, does present the racial equity and social justice um, summary documents that the school system prepares as part of its budget submission. Of course, this is um, in alignment with the um, racial equity and social justice work that um, is required uh, by the, the act that the council passed and required in the county law. And then also, again, in alignment with the work um, done through the executive branch relative to departments. So really, um, you know, the school system's budget submission does discuss the racial equity and social impact according to the functional chapters uh, within the budget document and I've both summarized those briefly here as well as attached them to your packet but certainly um, you know we've had many discussions at this committee and the board of course has continuing discussions as well of the 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 depth and the level to which racial equity and social justice is a uh, driving lens in the school systems work overall and um, and again we, we see that in nearly every conversation we have always top of mind for all of us um, is that thank you so uh, t we'll we'll do questions again we're not you know going this was the overview day there's certainly um, high-level questions that we can ask um, and we will as move forward over the next several sessions on on the items as, as are outlined in this packet uh, I did want to ask I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, one or two and then pass to my colleagues um, and uh, many of these can cut across multiple things uh, the health and wellness I would just like I kind of posed this question to you earlier uh, have you all started talking as a board and a system about what the appropriate level of effort and uh, investment into social, emotional, mental health supports is from the system visa versus other county 
entities or agencies. Um, have you thought about that question? And if so, what's that thinking at this point? You know, obviously you've made a request to keep what you currently have on board. Is that, yes, yeah, so I'll let you, so the question's clear. Yeah, uh, great question, very important question, thank you. Um, as you know, and has been pointed out here today already, um, our young people are uh, going through a lot right now and dealing with a lot coming out of COVID and with social media and just all of the changes uh, that we see in our society certainly impact our young people. And so these social emotional supports are critical because if our students aren't well, um, they're not gonna be in a space to learn. So we did meet uh, monthly, uh, at least throughout the budget process, throughout the fall with DHHS, um, so that we were able to collaborate around, um, you know, what services are they providing? What services are we providing? What um, might be duplicative? What, you know, is critical for the system to own versus DHHS? Um, of course, we could always use more. Uh, I mean, I think if we were representing um, what we would really like to see the supports for our schools, the number would be much higher. Um, but we did work with them and, you know, social workers is one example that was mentioned. Uh, they have social workers, we have social workers, um, but they play slightly different roles. I mean, they both have caseloads and that where they're working with individuals. Um, our social workers also play the role in addition to that of kind of being that frontline um, response uh, unit for our students and uh, often able to refer them to other uh, social services within the county and really provide that uh, that first line of uh, reaction and making sure that the needs are met and directed in the correct way. In addition to that, they of course do have caseloads where they're working continually with um, you know, uh, certain individuals throughout the year or whatever uh, the case may be. But yes, we have had significant discussions with them uh, as we look at both of our budgets and, and how things should most properly be aligned. And I guess, you know, the, the answer would be, you know, we feel that the the uh, positions that we're asking to bring back from ESSER are absolutely critical because without those, the level of service to our students is going down. Um, and so that's kind of what we reflected in this, trying to be fiscally prudent, as the superintendent mentioned. Certainly, um, if we were saying what we would really like to see in there, again, the number would be much higher. Yeah. I appreciate that. I mean, there's always this balance of, uh, and I tend to have an approach, but uh, as a legislator and as a person of asking, you know, really asking for what you need and then working your way back. Obviously, we're in a context where that's difficult sometimes. Um, and I do appreciate the point, which I think is a larger point about this budget that, you know, you've included $15 million in reductions in here, for example, like the, this is not like your blue sky budget. You know, like that. If we had, if I had a magic wand, what would I want, right? None of our our budget isn't that, right? Because there's just finite resources. So we appreciate you being a good partner in that regard. But I do think it's important to just say that, as contextualize it, because the needs, mental health, social emotional supports needs, just like many other needs, are overwhelming. You know, I I, I see it with my own kids. I see it with the students and and, and the fact the teachers, frankly, that I talk to as well. Um, and uh, I'm glad you've had those sessions, uh, and I think that should continue. That that should be an ongoing, you know, formalized process with DHHS. I don't know if it if it is or not, but uh, I think that would make sense because again, this is not we are in a this is not going back to a different place. Uh, we're going to have to continually evaluate, um, and I think that's why you know Dr. Kapunin is great to have. Like you know, we're just going to have to continually evaluate how we provide these services, we, the collective we, our community, our county, to our students. And obviously, you're, you're, you, MCPS is on the front lines of that. So uh, that's, that's good to hear. Uh, the other question I'll ask, and then I'll turn to colleagues, um, and then I do want to bring up one kind of hot topic that we've been hearing about. Uh, the, pers the absenteeism, right, which is something that cuts across a lot of you know, a lot of different areas. Um, one in particular, though, that has been stated by you all to us in the previous sessions uh, and as part of their job description is the pupil personnel workers, uh, whose part of their job is to go when you have someone chronically absent, visit the home, follow up, make the calls, try to work on that. Um, the staff packet notes that there are an additional 18.5 FTEs um, for, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. The it notices it, it, that they're at the same level 
for right. FY25. I've heard from the PPWs themselves, from staff and others, that that is an area where we think we need more investment. Uh, could you speak to, you know, we saw a 25.3% chronic absentee rate in 2023. Uh, that's approximately 40,000 students that are chronically absent um, uh, from last year's data. I hear about it from every principal, every, you know, this, this is a huge issue. Um, could you give a little context on what you're doing to address that and in in, in why we have the same request for PPWs this year as last year? Sure, so um, I'll speak to that. Um, obviously, this is a, a huge concern impacting Montgomery County's public schools, but also school systems are across the country. Um, and it has really increased uh, after COVID, I think. Uh, many people uh, got used to, you know, doing school from home um, and realizing, you know, getting out of that routine of getting up every morning and making sure that you're there. And I think some of the uh, issues that we raised earlier have probably contributed as well. So certainly something that we are um, concerned about and laser focused on. Um, I will say that the continuation of the personal, uh, the, the PPWs, um, <clears throat> Yes, well, it is. It maintains flat. Um, there certainly is a need for additional resources. But again, as we looked at this budget, we really did not look to add any significant accelerators or new programming just because we knew the fiscal climate of the county. Um, we did uh, bring back, as in addition to psychologists and social workers, some of our parent and community um, uh, coordinators. So these are people that work, you know, uh, very closely with PCCs. PP, yes. So a different but similar position. And we had 19 of those, I believe it was 19, that were currently on ESSER. And that is included in the um, ask, the $30 million that we're asking to bring back. And just to give a little high level uh, context too, we have about $120 million in this federal revenue budgeted this year. Uh, of the ESSER money. So it's $120 million that won't be there in revenue next year. And we're only off asking to bring back about $30 million of that. So about 25% of what we have this year is what we're requesting to bring back. And those requests do center around the social workers, uh, the psychologists, and the PPCs. Okay, I, I just, um, is it part of the PCCs to, to deal with, to try to get into the homes and, and respond, that's part of their role as well? I am not uh, able to respond to that. Okay. Looking. I see Ms. <laughs> Great I Board Member Rivera. I'm to add yes. <laughs> that it can be, that certainly it can be part of their okay. role. Um, meaning, if that's what the need is, uh, to go to homes and uh, engage families in that way, that, that certainly can be part of their role. And it's a, it's a whole uh, student well-being team that addresses uh, attendance sure. issues. So there's social workers, there's the parent community coordinators, the whole team looking at what's happening with the family and how they can address the underlying um, issues at home. So okay. not just one position. And I know we've talked about this before. I mean, obviously everyone is just, you know, the, the this issue of attendance is, again, nationally, but they want to hear, like, what's our, how are we, working on it at priority schools what's the plan some schools are having more challenges than others um and uh and then also just I'll, I'll bring up just because i have to and i promised i would when i was at a school last week the issue of uh the attendance policy just in general um that i think the, look obviously the board's purview um, but you have kids that are uh, either chronically absent because they're not there or they're missing half their classes most of the time during the day particularly in the high schools this is a problem that i hear about often and so they're technically present as far as the system because if you're 20 minutes if you do 20 minutes of the class you're you marked present but you've missed half of your education um, so this number when i see the 25.3 chronically absent i know it's worse than that because you have people that aren't even counted in our current policy because of that what I would call a loophole um, and it's something we just we really have to all get our hands around because it's every school I go to particularly the secondary schools 
it's something I'm hearing more and more. And it's it's connected to all of this. It's connected to the mental health. There's reasons why the kids are doing that or hanging in the bathroom or doing whatever. So we, um, uh, it just underscores, I think, the need for these social emotional supports. So, um, colleagues, okay, Councilmember May. Thank you. Um, so some of the additional, and I appreciate first the packet, great packet, really appreciate it, um, and um, and appreciation to MCPS for uh, coming to many of these sessions and um, uh, working with us to be as transparent as we can through this budgeting process. Um, some of the issues that we have heard a lot about through the year and also in our operating budget hearings. Um, and uh, you know, from staff and parents, uh, is the substitute teacher shortage? Uh, that's a big one that has a, a, a large impact on the ground, especially in our elementary schools. If we have kids who end up being you know moved to other classes for a, a short or longer period of time, um, special education staffing—that's a really big one. Um, and elementary school teacher planning time, of course, is a consistent topic of conversation. Uh, and the restorative justice programming as well that came through on, on ESSER funding. So, you know, some of this will have more opportunities to go into more detail as we go into our further committee sessions. But I um, wanted to see if you wanted to give any um, high level or more detailed thoughts about any of those topics and how you have considered. Uh, addressing any of those issues with this very, very difficult budget, um, or whether some of those are just not going to be possible to address at this time. If you could just kind of reflect on your thoughts around those issues, that'd be great. Um, yes, thank you for that. So obviously, we are in a, a place nationally where there's not enough teachers. There's not enough um, people who are able and willing to work in our schools. Um, we see that you know, reflected across the country. It's the same issue that um, many of our police departments and fire departments are having uh, across the country as well. So there just aren't enough um, qualified, high quality um, applicants for the positions, which makes it very difficult. But we've uh, done a number of things to address that. So I'll start with the substitutes. I think that was the first thing that you mentioned. Uh, and I'll first say that um, you know, we have a substitute budget, but that does not mean that if we hit, you know, the, the limit of that budget that we're going to stop hiring or stop bringing in substitutes. That's where we would make year-end adjustments. We are bringing in substitutes uh, every day, all of them that we can find to address uh, the uh, absenteeism um, and shortages in our schools. We've also added significantly to our long-term uh, sub-program, and so we have over 100 um, long-term subs, and so that's where uh, you know, a school identifies, you know, hopefully early on in the year that they've got a position that they're unlikely to be able to fill for whatever reason. And so then we're able to put a, a long-term sub there. And so that provides that stability for the school and for the students. Instead of looking for a new sub every day, uh, they have a consistent adult in that building that gets to know the students and can carry out the curriculum uh, in a much more effective way than if there were, you know, daily or regular changes to substitutes. Um, and again, you know, no limit on the number from a financial perspective perspective on the number of subs that we bring in. It's simply uh, a human capital uh, challenge. Um, for special education, uh, last year, uh, the school year of 22-23, we started the year with about 100 vacancies for special education teachers. This year, we started the year with about 50. So still, you know, a, a significant uh, challenge, uh, especially uh, in working with, um, you know, a, a subgroup that needs uh, that uh, specific attention and support. Um, but about half as many vacancies as we had last year. Uh, we continue to work um, in, in looking at you know, incentives that we can do. Um, our HR department is looking at uh, a program to bring in um, teachers from the Philippines that would come uh, with J-1 visas, and th that will add significantly to our, um, our population of special education teachers. So there's not enough teachers uh, in the state and in the country, so we are literally looking beyond that uh, to do whatever we can to make sure that we have high quality teachers uh, in front of our students. Um, planning time, one of the things that we negotiated with our uh, MCEA partners in this last round of negotiations was uh, a pilot for elementary school planning time. And so uh, that is something that the teams um, from both MCPS and MCEA have been working on this year is to figure out, you know, how can we do this without a significant financial uh, 
uh, impact. Uh, the easiest thing to do would be to add one more teacher, a specials teacher to every single school. Well, that comes at the price tag of you know tens of millions of dollars and financially very difficult. So we're looking at other ways that we can uh, work through that and provide our teachers uh, with the additional planning time they need. Um, and then again, with the restorative justice, everything that was included on ESSER that relates to restorative justice is included in the 30 Two million dollars that we're offering to, or that we're asking to bring back because we know how important those are. Thanks, I appreciate that, and the and the breakdown of uh, uh, or the insight into some of the conversations and possibilities that you've looked at and the price tag that comes associated with those. I think that's a, a really helpful conversation. Obviously, we can't have uh, that conversation, the same conversation that you all are, are having. We don't have the time to have all of those in front of the public. For, but in some of these high priority areas that I know we're all getting asked about, uh, I think that's a really helpful conversation to have. Like, if the public wants to see these things funded, like th this is why they're not being funded, or this is what it would take out of another piece of our county budget, for example. Uh, let's just be very, very realistic about some of the hard decisions uh, that are being made so that there is, is clarity there about why something is or or is not happening. So that's, that's helpful. And um, actually, I think I'll hold with that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember Alras. Thank you. Um, this is just a context setting conversation. We'll obviously dig deeper. but. Uh, and so I don't expect answers to what I'm about to ask or talk about, but you know, just as we sort of go through to have that framework. So there have been some, I think, very strong recommendations made by wonderful coalitions that have partnered with MCPS recently. I'm thinking specifically of the Black and Brown Coalition and others. Um, for example, the Black and Brown Coalition, among many recommendations, recommended enhancing and going more grassroots in how we communicate to parents. Um, a lot of complex information uh, in real time and there are some best practices that we've initiated recently through the Latino Health Initiative, the Abuelina Project, um, our friends in the African American Health Program have also launched some very successful grassroots campaigns and so if we can pull out uh, at some point, if, if we can, if it's appropriate, um, what some of those strategies are, maybe what some of those other recommendations have been um, that we, we think might be helpful uh, to addressing some of the myriad of challenges you all are facing. So that's just one example. There are others, but I'd, I'd be curious as to how that plays into our decision making on the budget process. Secondly, um, you know, there, there are needs across the board, um, but there are some that have, have um, garnered more attention recently. Uh, safety and security uh, is one of them, uh, which I know the school system is very much focused on uh, in partnership, not just with law enforcement, but with our community as a whole. So that that's an area of particular interest to me and what are the strategies that you all are utilizing in this budget as it's proposed to address those challenges, um, what's new, what's different, what's being altered, what's being adjusted, what's being changed, um, that, that would be important. Similarly, in that same second category, um, the issue of special education uh, has come up repeatedly and, uh, and, and very much the issue of, of literacy and, and reading and math scores, particularly at third and fifth grades, uh, which the numbers were shocking uh, and I know we're all very concerned about. And we've had sessions to talk about what some of the strategies you all are utilizing to address those. And, and I know we've made some improvements and gains, and we'll talk about that. But how specifically does this budget address that need, um, those strategies? Um, that, that's something that I'd, I'd like to dig into a little bit more as well. And then not finally, but finally for now on that, that same bucket, um, there are infrastructure issues such as maintenance that I know are so critical uh, and don't get the attention they deserve. And so I'm very open to and, and would like to have conversations about those infrastructure issues that you all are dealing with and that are impacting your ability to be able to teach effectively. Um, and it's not sexy, um, but it is something that I know is, is very necessary. So that's something that I'll, I'll hope to, to dig into. And then the next sort of category, we received some compelling testimony, as we always do during the budget process, um, regarding specific issues that may have arisen. 
for example, uh, we heard from a teacher that talked about the challenges in issuing Chromebooks and that some students are inappropriately utilizing those Chromebooks to play games or even look at inappropriate sites uh, while they're in the classroom. And she specifically mentioned a security tool um, that she felt, and I'm, I'm not recalling the name of it, yes, Go Guardian, um, but she had been told uh, that that program had been cut uh, and so that, that they, she could no longer utilize that tool, um, but it was one of the few that she felt was effective in giving teachers the chance to help provide some uh, reasonable response to, to ensuring students are using Chromebooks appropriately. That's just one of many examples of, of little things here and there that we're hearing from, well, we've been told it's been cut because of the budget. We've been told it's been cut because of the budget. Sometimes that's not always true, um, but as we dig into this, there will likely be other line items like that that, that we'll want to follow up on, and that's one of them. Uh, don't need a response now, but you know that's something I want to think through. Um, and then lastly, for now, so, and, and Ms. Wagar, I know you mentioned this while I, was, while I was in the other room, this holistic look at the needs of children, youth, and families. Um, we're going to have the opportunity specifically with regards to linkages and other programs that cross over to HHS, but there's a lot more um, that we know. And so I, I'd like, it's always difficult as we go through the budget planning process, but it's the most acute way for us to look holistically at these issues sometimes. And so if there are needs that go beyond the classroom and the school system itself, um, I'd encourage my colleagues at MCPS to bring those up, um, whatever they may be. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing huge food and nutrition issues. We're seeing major transient issues because of housing instability. Um, you know, th this is a time for us to uplift those, those broad, really complicated issues, but that impact your all's ability to be effective. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we need to talk about that year round, uh, but in the context of the budget, this is a good time. So um, there'll be a lot more, um, but those are some of the things I wanted to frame for now. Really appreciate that, and I'm glad I saw everyone taking notes. Uh, I will mention one of those things, transportation for your after school providers. Mm -hmm. I met with a men set of mentoring groups uh, last week, and I'm working on a mentoring summit. I've talked to many of you about uh, with my colleagues. Everyone will be invited. Uh, the shift over the last few years, moving them to volunteers for liability reasons, uh, as opposed to removing their ID. They, they, they're no longer considered whatever they were. I can think contractors or employees um, in the building. The ability for them to uh, get kids out of the school building, which is what they want to do, and transport them places. Another thing that's not a teaching and learning thing, but it's big time connected to the social, emotional, health, and well-being of, of particularly our, some of our most vulnerable students. So something to add to your list we'll come back to, and I think that's a, a, one of those good conversations for the joint as well. Uh, I know Councilmember uh, Mink had a point to make. Yeah, just wanted to circle back real quick on the topic of um, uh, mental health. Certainly uh, agree and appreciate that thinking about the infrastructure we want to be um, working towards is a conversation that we need to be having and we need to be getting figured out. Also want to acknowledge that we don't have enough resources anywhere in the county, in the schools, and this is one of the biggest topics that I hear about from not only parents and families and teachers, but students themselves, elementary school students. Looking, maybe they don't always have the words for it, but looking for mental health supports. So I just want to emphasize that absolutely we should be planning, um, but I do not see us at being at a point where we should be looking at taking any of the mental health supports that the system that MCPS is scraping together within the schools. Um, we don't have the resources elsewhere to be able to make up for that. We're not serving uh, families and students uh, across the county, in schools, out of schools, all this. Uh, we're just not at a point where we have enough going on, and I think we need to maintain what we have while we look at uh, what direction we are, we are moving towards. So just wanted to know 
note that for the record. Um, and then uh, real quick on restorative justice as well. I'm glad that that is part of the 30 million. Um, wish we had the funding to be able to expand that because I know in the, some of the results that we saw from the pilot around um, being able to have uh, full-time folks rotating through some of our priority schools, that there were some very, very good results that came out of that and that those crossed a number of really high priority areas from academics to public safety um, and to uh, you know student wellness, a, a, number, a number of things. The benefits were, were large, so I just wanna make sure that um, as we continue to talk about that, um, that we, that that is part of the conversation as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we are going to, uh, in a moment, move on. But I, I, I do want to bring this up because I think the right people are here uh, to talk about it, the uh, the Darnstown Early Learning Center issue. And I know I've mentioned this to you. We, we heard about it uh, from quite a few folks uh, over the last several days and, and weeks, as I know you have. Um, I, I do think. Uh, that there is a lack of clarity around what and why is ha what's happening and why it's happening um, and what the impacts will be not only on those 68 students and families but also on the larger context um, so if are the appropriate people here to address that dr felder yes i'd like to invite um diana wiles uh, she is the associate superintendent for the office of special education Great. And table. we were going to go into depth on special education on April 29th, uh, writ more writ large, but I think this, I don't want to wait three weeks to have you since you're here. So could you explain, introduce yourself and explain the, uh, what what is happening at Darn Center Learning Center, how it connects to the larger <coughs> pie, you know, for autism students, um, and what has been communicated to the families and the public. Good morning, uh, Chair Jawando, committee members, um, Diana Wiles, I'm the Associate Superintendent for the Office of Special Education. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this issue. So for the FY25 school year, we have made some adjustments to the number of uh, staff, particularly the paraeducator staff at Darnstown Learning Center. I think it's important to have some um, context in terms of how Darnstown came about and what the staff and different differential is when we compare it to other learning centers. First, learning centers are just self-contained classes. Um, they are regional sites. We have 13 in the school system. They're for students that have more significant needs and they require services outside of general education for the majority of their day. Of the 13, Darnstown had been identified for the last, um, not 10 years, but the actual, that actual autism program has been in existence for 10 years. I think for the last five or so years, it's been um, located at Darnstown, and I may not be exact sure. on that, on that uh, number of years. Um, Darnstown was created in partnership with sev several other organizations to provide some specific um, strategies to work with students with autism. Um, as you all know, students with autism have a continuum of needs. Um, for the students, particular students that were identified to um, receive services at Darnstown, uh, they were there because uh, it was determined through the, pro through the IEP process that this was a set of services, strategies um, that these students would benefit from most. When uh, in 2018, there were approximately 27 students who were at Darnstown. Um, and that number was, was steady until about 2023 when it grew to 48 students. And over time, that number of students has grown because the number of students with autism and with some pretty significant needs identified with autism has grown in the district. Of our other 12 learning centers, over 50% of the students in those learning centers are identified as students with autism. And many of those students are students who were referred to Darnstown, but because of, um, because we can't put all of the students that have that level of need in one location, they have um, been placed at schools, at other learning centers. However, um, because of COVID and, and other factors, 
we have not had the opportunity to provide, to provide the level of professional learning to um, our other learning centers that to, in order to meet these student needs in the past. So <clears throat> we decided to reduce the number of paraeducators, not teachers, because we would no longer make Darnstown a, a countywide program or a central hub for these services. Our goal is to ensure that all of our learning centers have the same level of training so that any student that they receive that require the services that are offered at Darnstown can be met in any of those schools. In addition to that, we have students who are currently at Darnstown that are um, transported. It takes an hour, almost an hour and 40 minutes for some students to get there. And so we want to we want to create a system where students are able to not be on the bus as long and to be closer to their neighborhood schools where they are part of the community. When we looked at the numbers, um, currently there are 60 students that are enrolled at Darnstown in that specific learning center. We have more students who are identified with special education services, but specifically for the Darnstown Learning Center, there are 60 students. Um, when, as our fifth graders exit this year for middle school, our intention is not to increase that number of students who are referred there for specific autism resources and supports. Um, the uh, anticipated or projected number for next year would be 55 students. However, and over time, that number would be reduced because students would be going to their to a closer learning center closer to their home. Yeah. Um, we've also began to uh, develop some professional learning that will begin in the summer so that we can ensure that those um, other staff members and other learning centers are provided the supports that they need so that they can uh, better service all of the students. Um, the students that are currently there can remain there. They, and they are remaining there. Students who are currently kindergarten through fourth grade will matriculate to their next grade at Darnstown and will remain there. Um, they are still there with teachers who were, um, you know, who have this, the level of professional learning that they need to continue to provide the services. Um, and ultimately, we make decisions about staffing based on student need, and we review that annually for budgetary needs just so that we can project what you know whether or not we need additional teachers or paraeducators but we look at that throughout the school year right. and so if there are needs that arise if we have students that um, their needs change throughout the school year and we certainly do then we make adjustments accordingly and we have the ability to add additional supports when necessary to any of those um, learning centers or any of the services that we provide throughout the district. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple questions, I'm sure my colleagues have, have questions, and uh, we may, uh, yeah, I'll see you about the second item, we'll come back to you. Um, we may make an adjustment, you know, on the second item so we can talk about this. Uh, so it sounds like, and you correct me if, if I'm mischaracterizing what you said, I'm going to summarize what I think I heard you say. Uh, students at Darnstown were receiving uh, a deep, a deeper, a higher level of service than some of the other learning centers. Is that a fair statement? Um, I wouldn't say or, higher, or, or more intensive, and had more more, more people, more intensive, more people, um, teachers and paraeducators that have been had received more training, some different training right, right. than others. Yeah, yes. and obviously, when you're starting a new program, I experienced this. I, as I said yesterday, I, we celebrated Autism uh, Acceptance Month. I have a daughter who's autistic who's in MCPS. She started at, at, at a school where the program was newer. And just by definition, the, those, those folks were not as experienced. And it was a first year teacher. And, you know, the pairs, you know, then she, when we moved, she moved to a place where the team had been together for 12 years, right? And the same pairs and teachers. So it was obviously a different experience. Uh, in level of, you know, that happens. You can't, it's not always happening equally. We understand that. But so that would, to me, speaks to you're trying to have, it's an equity issue, trying to make sure that students 
across the county have access but that needs to be uh, then why wouldn't you just put more paraeducators at those schools as opposed to taking them from the place where the they're at Darnstown where they're receiving it is that is that budgetary consideration or there were just not enough paraeducators what talk to me about that so why would why would they be removed to, to as opposed to added because we're anticipating that the number of students would decrease over time um, we have uh, and number of is going to decrease next year um, so you said by five students though 60 to 55 for ne next year yes but you but the paraeducators went from 12 to 6 next year right? for next year so the right. ratios would still be there would be a higher student to teacher ratio at Darnstown next year not student and teacher, parent. Para, teacher. Excuse me, parent. Well, you know the parents like their educators too. They all, they always remind me. So the ed, para educators to student ratio will be higher at Darnstown next year than it is this year. Correct. So what we did is and for look, probably a couple of years, I would think. Um, so what we yeah. looked at is what actually is happening in the program and the needs of our students. And um, it is a, a well-run program. Um, and it, as you said, for equ we want to be equitable in the services, the, um, the way that we're staffing our other learning centers. Um, I think the assumption is that if there are more people, that uh, the program will run better. Um, and I'm not, we, ha we have, we are in the process of looking at that when we look at student need. And so, as I said, when students come in who are new or when student needs change, we make adjustments. But student ratio, uh, ratios of teachers or parents are not set in stone. And so for any of our programs, we look at it throughout the course of a year and we look at it at budget season. Is this effective? Is this needed? Um, can we utilize these positions? Um, in other ways to uh, to support other uh, parts of the district, right? And you know, as Dr. Felder said, this is a people business. Um, and you know, I think the the second part of my question, I'll turn to colleagues, is on the communication of this to families, right? Uh, where I think you know, we, if we're being honest, it was there. We didn't. I, I'm going to ask you to speak to how it was communicated, but that I don't think we did the best job in this case. Um, if you told me today that my child was going to be, the, the paraeducators who, who she loves were going to be removed, and I didn't have appropriate context or the, the, the you know, whatever information, which I also want you to speak to, that you used to de determine, and when you determined that the level of para to students was not required to provide the same level of service, which is I'm assuming what you is your opinion. If that wasn't fully explained to me and like I had a lot of time to process it and you know and I still probably would have been upset, you know, just because of the role particularly for autistic students and special education students that the paras play. Um, and uh, so could you so where what first what were you basing that determination on that there wouldn't be a, a decrease in level of service for these students what what studies or information or you know how did you come to that conclusion and then two how was that how and when was that communicated to the parents in, at Darnstown so again we looked at what student um, the, the students needs um, and the progress the students are making in uh, at Darnstown um, Obviously, everyone wants more staff um, and believes that they require more staff. Um, however, um, with the support of our pro our uh, program specialists and um, our team, central office team, we review student progress to determine that um, given the level of professional learning the teachers at, at Darnstown had um, and the support from the pro program specialist who you know has been steeped in this work that we could uh, reduce that number um, at this time so based on this, how the students were performing 
the level of qualifications and professional learning of the staff there, you felt like it was a okay, you, you could do that and keep a, a, a commensurate level of service for those students. Was that communicated to the parents, and if so, when? So I, I will acknowledge we could have done a much better job of communications. Um, it was first communicated to the principal through our staff and allocation process. Um, Which is when? In February. Uh, so two months ago. Yes. Okay. Um, at that, in, which is the time where when uh, that happens, right? Yeah. Correct. Um, subsequently, uh, we got uh, parents got word and began to um, express some express some concern. Um, That's an understatement. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so at this point, what we've done is we are um, scheduled to do a community meeting uh, at sometime this month. I don't have the exact date with okay. me. Um, where we will have uh, several uh, individuals from central office to help support the conversation and explain what the change was. Okay. Um, we've also sent a letter out um, last week to families with a frequently asked questions document explaining uh, the change um, and inform of the, informing them of um, the fact that you know if your child is there presently they can continue to stay there the reasoning behind the change and the six paras and who they would need to reach out to if they um, had specific questions about their children okay. um, but we also will be reaching out directly to families if they and offering to schedule meetings with them one-on-one -on -one, um, if they do have questions that are beyond what we'll discuss at the community meeting Got it. Okay, so we're playing catch up now. Admittedly, we're as, playing as catch you said. up. Um, you know, look, I know this is hard. We the identification we acknowledge that the identification of students with autism has dramatically increased, which is a good thing because we want people identified early and we want them to get services. But it obviously puts a strain on the system. You need to make sure everyone gets the appropriate level of service. Um, I, I appreciate you acknowledging that communication could have gone better here, but. When you take, you know, you you when you remove half of the paraeducators from a program that people love, you know, they're going. To, I think we could have anticipated this, um, and there the reasons you're stating today. Everyone doesn't have to agree with them, but I think they're they are a valid, uh, you know, they're valid and totally rational reasons. But it just needs to be explained, and people need to really understand, you know, why how that's going to happen and why. Um, so I just wanted to get that out there. I'm glad you're doing those things. I'll, I'll turn to colleagues. Um, please keep us posted again, because we probably got, you know, 30, 30 people or so that and parents from the center that came out and testified. And, um, and we've heard, we got a ton of emails. It, the good news is this program's a great program, and people love the program. And so, I mean, let's not bury that lead. But uh, we want to make sure it's accessible to to those students who are still there, but also to other students, and we just need to communicate. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff with MCPS, we've talked about this, is around the why, the how. You know, again, we make decisions all the time that people don't like, but we try to communicate why we're doing them. So, uh, Councilman Rabinas. Oh, man. Um, so, it, really compelling and emotional testimony on this from parents who had been through hell frankly um you know with with their family situations um significant bullying lost um and and at darnstown was was just it's been it's been a lifeline uh for for many of these families who had been seeking something like this and so i want to start from this place which is acknowledging this is a successful program um, that that it is is loved um, and so and understanding budget challenges understanding equity issues you know I, I I'd prefer to tackle this from how do we raise all boats here and create more Darnstown programs and what does that look like uh, and 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 that should be an important focal point of the conversation moving forward and within the within the context of the budget um, because this is obviously um, as has been stated and we all acknowledge a significant growing need um, and so I, I, you know we don't have to talk about that right now but I, we do need to talk about that soon um, and, and what why is this working so well and rather than 
stripped from it, not, you know, for, for legitimate reasons to some degree, how do we make sure that it's, it's replicated more effectively? That's one thing. The second thing is, I, I guess, and, and I don't understand how the system works, you know, it's a big system, you know, with your all's responsibilities and then the responsibilities at the school level. Um, but communicating something to a principal who's then in the very difficult position of having to communicate something to parents is clearly where something very significantly got lost in translation. Um, and so I guess my question for the central office is when a system central office decision is made, what is the policy? What is What are the steps taken to be able to support on the school level how and when information is communicated? It's a much broader category, but this isn't the first time that we've heard a decision was made by central office on you name the issue, communicated through the principal, and something's been lost in translation. Like, how, how are we addressing that issue generally? Thank you so much for that question. Um, indeed, communication is absolutely critical, and we recognize that this is an area that we have work to do for all the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, and so one of the things that we are, or protocol that we're putting in place, <coughs> excuse me, is to ensure that whenever we are starting a new initiative, changing uh, an, an initiative, whatever it is that we're doing, that we bake in a communication plan on the front end uh, that involves our communications department, that is their area of expertise, that includes when it impacts a school, that we're not only communicating with the principal first, but also uh, the principal's uh, supervisor to ensure that they are clear and understand, and then moving to staff and um, families and other stakeholders accordingly. So we, we certainly own and recognize that this is an area of, of that we have to work on uh, so that we can not find ourselves in the position of being on the defensive, but uh, getting ahead and being more proactive uh, and ensuring, because we want everyone to understand. Uh, they, to your point, they may not necessarily like it, but uh, just to not be able to, uh, not have the information that they need on the front end and understand the why uh, is it, and the how uh, things are going to uh, unfold uh, is important. And then included in that is what is the regular drip of information and communication that, um, uh, that we provide and how do we pr uh, uh, communicate. And so, uh, so for example, if we simply rely on um, uh, text messages or email, we have to look at the, the broad, uh, comprehensive approach to how we communicate uh, with families. And again, the cadence in which we do that. So again, we are, it is an area that we have acknowledged that we have to work on across the board. We are putting in protocols and procedures in place to ensure that we do a better job of that. Um, because it could certainly um, help eliminate a, a lot of issues. Uh, and we don't want our families and staff to have angst uh, simply because we didn't do a good enough job in terms of communicating and communicating early on the front end. I, I appreciate that. I mean, those are technical terms, protocols and systems, and but this is just, there's a human element to this that you know should have been pretty straightforward and common sense. Um, the paraeducators themselves, I'm sure, probably love being at that school um, and have a de developed relationships with those families. And so I'm sure there's some angst within the staff itself about the possibility of being transferred. So I guess my next question is for you, Ms. Silvestre. It's not appropriate, nor is it our lane as a council, to nickel and dime and to address you know, policy issues. This rose up at a very significant level to us but you all deal with issues like this and many more every day. Um, from the board's perspective, and I appreciate and respect that there are, it sounds like plans being developed on learning from this and improving moving forward, but how is the board going to tackle, oversee? Do you agree that there are some of these communication breakdowns? And you and I have had this conversation before, but I'd just love to hear from you um, representing the board how you all plan to make sure that those protocols not only are developed but followed through on. 
Yes, um, thank you. I, I think we can agree as long as I've been on the board, uh, communications has been an area that needs to be improved for the school system uh, and continues to be. Um, what Dr. Feller is talking about is creating a communications plan for every that every decision, every no, don't rely on the principal because that is the kind of the standard operation is the principal gets the information and it's up to them to communicate with their school community. Um, I think that, um, you know, we have to have a discussion with the board, which we have not had, in terms of how we uh, institutionalize the, the plan that Dr. Felder wants to put in place in terms of having a communications plan to make, make that the expectation uh, when decisions are made, budget or otherwise, policy decisions as well. Um, so we have not had that discussion, to be very frank with you, but I think um, it's a systemic issue that after five years of being on the board, I haven't seen uh, enough progress in so that we, we need to have and we will be having. Okay. Well, I, you know, we'll, over the course of this year, beyond just the budget process, this is something we'll clearly need to revisit. Um, and it just, it just continues. Things are challenging as it is, you know what I mean? And so just trying to not make unforced errors that compound the challenges that you all are already dealing with on a good day, um, I think is going to be obviously critical moving forward. I'll, I'll yield back to you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the line of questioning, Councilman Robert Noss, and I also appreciate the effort of MCPS staff and administration. I know you're not trying to, you're trying to get the job done for the most students, but we have to hold ourselves to the standard of doing it in a way that is we extra communicative with the community and that we just have to do we're just in a different period now and uh the old model top down used to work doesn't work anymore and and i think it, and probably you know so I, I just appreciate you acknowledging that we will not talk about today we have we have title one on may 1st but there's another issue on the title one schools uh the four that have been moved off uh president Silvestri and i and several council members were at a meeting at oakview uh, on Friday night um, where we heard about that but I think it's another example of opportunity for better communication and collaboration with the community before a, deci a big decision we're not talking about change the strawberry milk even though for some kids that's a big decision we're talking about like funding changes status losing half of a, a category of education these are big things um, so I don't think everything ri rises to the level of the deep level of communication needs to happen but but these do. So we will talk about that uh, later. I just wanted to mention that for folks as well. Councilmember May. Thanks. Second, all of that conversation about communication. I'm just going to just want to name that I, I appreciate the um, uh, pursuit of equity here and certainly understand uh, the importance of that and that, uh, you know, seeing the lack of it in the way that it has that it has played out and the change in population and so on and the effort to address that. Also, to uh, Councilmember Albernoz's point about the desire to, you know, raise all ships here, um, uh, you know, it's just hard for me to, as a former teacher, to wrap my mind around the ability to have only five students are leaving the program, but half of the paras are, and that the quality is going to be maintained. Where we have a program that, um, you know, so many families are finding relief in because it works, and as was said earlier today the programs work because of the people that are in them um, so you know if there if this is a a budget decision and if you had your druthers we would be maintaining uh, you know a higher number of paras at Darnstown like I think we need to be honest about that as well we are in a difficult budget situation and if you're having to make decisions that you don't want to make let's have some of those tough conversations here we're the ones who are allocating the budget so we should have to be responsible for some of that as well obviously we don't line item here um, but i think having again bringing more of those difficult conversations forward uh, in the council space especially around some of these very high priority areas like special education uh, I, you know i think it's important to have those difficult conversations as well so i know we're going to be coming back to that um, and that you're also going to be having community community conversations around that um, but uh, seeing decreases around services to, um, uh, to in, in the special education space is, is just very, very 
uh, alarming. And so, uh, you know, we want to be your partners here in making sure that we're providing the level of services that we need to be providing as best as is possible. And so just want to continue to invite you to bring those difficult conversations here as well. Thank you. Appreciate that point, uh, Councilor Mink, from both my colleagues, and obviously, and I'm, thank you for being here to address that. And I know it's not easy work. Uh, so thank you for, for what you're doing and uh, for just providing some clarity. I think that that will help in, as, we, as we move forward. Um, we're going to move now to we're gonna, uh, the th our third item on the MCPS academic achievement. Uh, we will come back to, after the budget, uh, the OLO report on public and private funding sources. So just so we can catch up some time. Um, so are, are there any, uh, thank you, President Sylvester. Thank you, Dr. Felder. Um, so whoever from MCPS is coming down for that uh, presentation, please do. All right, hello. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, could everyone just introduce themselves on the panel, please? Ms. Dr. Addison, there. All right, wherever you want to start. Yeah, that's fine. Yes, go ahead. I'll go first. Hi, yeah. I'm Keisha Logan. I'm the director for the Department of Pre-K through 12 Curriculum. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hello, Nikki Hazel, Associate Superintendent, Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs. Great Wednesday morning. Genevieve Floyd, I supervise Career and Post-Secondary Partnerships. Good morning, Keisha Addison, Director of Shared Accountability. All right, awesome. Thank you for being with us. Um, nothing to say? Okay. I know you all have some slides, quite a few, so we're going to tee that up, and then we'll, what we'll probably do, I'll let you tee that up, but we'll probably do is pause when we have questions as opposed to trying to wait and re remember all 20 slides, so that way we can, and we'll aim to end uh, no later than uh Hopefully in about an hour or so. So just, but we'll see how we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Go ahead. And I'll just very briefly um, state that the this item, the committee has um, expressed interest and continues to have sort of uh, ongoing reviews of academic data with MCPS. Obviously, there, that covers a whole lot of territory. Um, the college and career ready data. Uh, is, is sort of one that's um, most current, and that's one reason why we wanted to dive into it here today. There is also, at the end, um, a quick update on some of the early math and literacy data, um, which again is obviously um, something we want to continue to yeah. keep an eye on. However, more updated data in that area will be forthcoming in a few weeks because this is always an ongoing process. So for so in that respect, the committee probably would return over the summer or potentially in the fall, but probably over the summer to get that most updated data. So I just wanted to say we're sort of in that real-time experience with Absolutely. this. Um, this data, again, is the, is the most current presentation, but we'll have sort of a point-in-time snapshot on some of those other measures. I know my daughter was taking the map this week, so I, and she's in fourth grade, so, I know, so I'm assuming that. But I know there's lags in all this stuff. Um, okay, so who is the, who's Ms. Hazel? All right. Well, thank you for having us today. Um, thank you, Ms. McGuire. As uh, she stated, we are going to start with a presentation on college and career readiness. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, today, our discussion is going to be related to the interim college and career ready measures. And today we're going to define what it means to be college and career ready. We'll talk about the measures that students need to meet. And we will also just talk about uh, expectations from the state. We're going to share with you the FY23 student data for the 10th grade academic pathway milestone and place that data into some context. And we'll also provide an update on the CCR empirical study and the state's decisions that um, have had an impact on uh, our data and some of the implications moving forward. So if you can go to the next slide, please. 
So you can see here we have our, our pathways that we have for our students in MCPS, and we're going to provide an update on the academic milestone college and career uh, readiness. And you can see that grade 10 CCR measure is directly tied to and aligned to the blueprint for Maryland's future re legislation. The state, like MCPS, seeks to ensure that our students are college and career ready and that we are aware of their readiness before they graduate from uh, high school. Uh, there is additional work that needs to be completed by the state to ensure that all school districts collect and report accurate data. In the interim, we are moving forward to ensure that we work closely with our post-secondary partners to ensure our data accurately reflects our students' readiness for college and careers. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Floyd to take us through the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Hazels, and greetings again, council members. Before I jump into the presentation, I just wanted to share a um, celebratory comment. You may be aware, Chair Jawanda, that we are celebrating or we are on track to be number one in the state yet again in our dual enrollment degree programs where we will celebrate over 300 students who are graduating with their college degree next month. Last year, you were the closer. You gave closing remote remarks, Chairperson Jawando, and we certainly hope you are available to do I that again. Wait. And actually hope that each of you are able to attend this event. It, 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 is a remarkable event. It's a celebration of academic e excellence, and I'm sure you will be proud to see our young scholars. So I'll make sure Ms. McGuire has that information, so if you're available, you will be able to attend. We believed it would be appropriate to start with this slide, just to start with a high-level overview of the expectations around the work that we must complete for college career readiness. As you know, the Blueprint legislation is a massive legislation, but this work, the topic that we're going to discuss today, falls squarely under Pillar 3. Pillar 3 actually has four major bodies of work, four objectives. This work is under Objective 1. Within Objective 1, there were six primary bodies of work that we needed to complete, agencies around the state needed to complete. The first task was for LEAs. All school districts were charged with assessing the college career readiness of our students by the end of grade 10 using interim measures. We have done that. We began doing that in 2022. You will hear about the 2023 data today. In FY23, there were multiple tasks assigned to MSDE, one related to coordinating and consulting with various entities in the state, which included the Maryland Higher Education Commission, MHEC, the Maryland Association of Community Colleges, MAC, the Governor's Workforce Development Board, specifically the CTE committee that falls under that board, as well as the Accountability Implementation Board, AIB, to ensure that their duties were performed and to support that implementation. In addition, in FY23, MSDE, they were required to develop and to implement a communication strategy to ensure that stakeholders across the state, that the wider public was aware of this charge around college career readiness, the impact and the implications for our students and for our schools. The last task associated with MSDE for FY23 required that they enter into a contract contract with an entity to conduct an empirical study to determine if the CCR measures were appropriate, to recommend alternative measures, to do a deeper dive. They in fact did that. They contracted with the American Institutes for Research, who completed their study in the fall of last year and provided that information to the State Board of Education. The State Board was charged this fiscal year with adopting new measures or cut scores. They, in fact, did that in January. So you're going to hear more about the recommendations, the feedback, and the decision that was made later on in this presentation. Cut what scores has not, meaning the level of which you are deemed proficient and on track to be yes, sir. at college and career readiness. Those recommendations yeah. and the decision about that. So the last task um, is also for MSDE that has yet to begin. It's slated to begin in 2025 to be completed in 2027. It's around the alignment of an instructional system, really looking at the curriculum, the instructional materials across the state to ensure that what we are teaching aligns to what will be assessed. 
So that's a very high level overview of the work that has been completed that still needs to be completed around this college career readiness measure and the standards. Now we're going to go deeper into the interim measures that were used in the FY23 data and to do that I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Addison. Thank you and good morning again. And so as you heard from Ms. Hazel and Dr. Floyd, um, as a district we have had an intentional focus on ensuring our students are college and career ready. More specifically, as we developed our pathway to college and career readiness, we wanted to ensure that it aligned to Maryland's blueprint for the future. And so um, this slide provides you with what Dr. Floyd indicated, which are those interim measures for designating whether or not a student is college and career ready. So during February 2022, the Maryland State Department of Education shared these interim measures, which are measured by the end of grade 10. And um, as part of their communication, they shared that a student is designated as college and career ready if they meet at least one of the standards listed on this slide for English and one of the standards listed for mathematics. And so one of the things I would like to share um, is that part prior to this transition, transition, sorry, to these identified measures, the number of measures um, used for designating a student as college and career ready was broader. So prior to this, we were monitoring our data related to college and career readiness using the College and Career Readiness and College Completion Act of 2013, which was assessed at the end of the 11th grade. And so, um, so the one thing to keep in mind is we've shifted to a focus on measuring at the end of 10th grade and fewer measures that we're using to designate students. Um, another point I want to raise for you is as you look at this slide and you see the last bullet under mathematics, you see that there's a score on the SAT. Well, at MCPS, we um, provide and we cover the cost for students to take the SAT during the 11th grade and we cover the cost for the PSAT in the 10th grade. And so you'll hear a bit more about that as we talk about the empirical study, but I wanna raise that so as you see the numbers that are coming up, you have an understanding in terms of the opportunities for students to demonstrate um, their skills on these measures. And one final thing before we move forward is um, when we were using the College and Career Readiness College Completion Act measures um, from 2013, uh, for our class of 22, for example, we on average typically have between 60 to 64 percent of our students being designated as college and career ready using that measure of both in English and in mathematics. Okay, before you move, let me uh -huh. just make sure I understand what this is. So, current this is the current standard. This is the this is interim, the proposed standard. interim standard until we get the the standard that's coming. That and we do have the standard that's coming, so okay. we will get to that. But in terms of the data that's coming next, it applies, it applies these, to this. Yes. So when you talk about the students who, they, so this means they could have scored a four or five on the, the State park yes. uh, test, a two or three on the <coughs> MCAP, or a mm -hmm. three or four on the fall. So that either any of those qualified you to Correct. be proficient. Yes. Okay, and the same for below. Yes. Under the interim standard. Under the interim standard. And the standards. data you're going to show us on the next slide is for this. The application. This is a lower the, standard than the one. This is a. Um, how, how would you do, compare the standard to the one that's coming? I would say that this standard reduced the opportunities for students to be designated as meeting college and career ready because they had fewer measures that they could that so the apply. ones that are coming are, are, are larger it's more measures and it, it is not more measures the college and career readiness college completion act of 2013 included more measures so for example under english and mathematics the act was also included right. as a way to demonstrate or meet for one of these so it's reduced which reduces opportunities which is reduced this new standard the new standard and the interim standard and was the interim reduced. standard were reduced from the from the college from the and career completion okay, act so it's becoming harder to correct yeah so that's what i'm trying to get at it so is more challenging for to be students right, seen prof to be to be proficient. deemed college There's and less career ways ready. to be yeah so imagine having that. eight measures right. 
And then you can meet any one of those eight measures under English. Right. And now you only have three. So it's more heavily relying on these high, high state, state assessments. Tests, right. Yes. So this is 22, 23, 23 was the first year of the um, interim standards. Right. That's, so this the data we're going to see. It's is, connected to this you could slide right here. be deemed proficient if you did one of any right. of these. The, then the, what the standards to come are actually more narrow than this. Correct. Okay. Which could be seen as good or bad depending on who you are. You know, you know. So there's been a movement over the years to multiple measures. We're moving away from that again now. So, but go ahead. Yes. So <laughs> next slide. <laughs> Leading up to this. So. Um, Don't make sure we understood what we were looking at. Correct. And so, one thing you'll notice. I'll just just thinking about the interest of time. But that first row. So we're going to go across the first row. So for our um, students who ended in MCPS grade 10, we had 13,569 students at the end of the 22-23 school year. And thinking about the measures on that previous slide where in order to be designated as college and career ready, the focus is on the final column. So of the 13,569 students using the interim um, CCR standards identified by the state, we had 9.4% of our students meeting at least one of the measures in English and one in math. And Dr. Floyd will follow up with some additional information in terms of how we should be contextualizing this um, and thinking about it. And then that's why I intentionally mentioned what it looked like before under the previous act where on average we had mid to low 60% of our students being able to demonstrate because they had more opportunities. drop. Right. Of proficiency and we were looking at it at the end of 11th grade which right. factors in the ability for students to take the SAT right. because we do not have high percentages of our students taking the SAT in 10th grade okay. um, do we have a measurement of what the percentages would be under the old standards so that we could compare apples to apples and see how much of that change is due to the change in standards and how much is due to um, student uh, performance and experiences over the last few years? Yes, so the we can get that to you, but the um, percentage that I shared, like 64%, yeah, is, is the prior, right? Okay. So, and that was class of 22, and this is, would be class of, I mean, this would, that was 2022, this is 2023. So that tells you, but we can definitely because provide that in paper form sure. so you can kind of see it easier. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, so, as you look at this slide, you see overall, um, looking at students who met both, that final column is what is indicated and what the definition of college and career ready would be. Um, you will also notice as you look across the slide, the differences for our students and our different racial ethnic groups and our students receiving services in terms of the overall um, numbers of students meeting. So and the, the percentages. The reason there's no black or African American or Hispanic Latinos because not enough students. So I What's yeah I need to go that? back because I'm not sure why those were dashed out. I think that might have been an oversight because there okay because be it looks like 46 percent of yeah. African American students met it met for ma for English reading mm -hmm. and less than five percent for math. Yes. So I'll just double check, but it, okay. for our note, it says the results are reported because there were fewer than 10 students. So, so that's the large and overall, and then how many met? Well, yeah, I would, I would deem that to mean that if less than 5% made it in math, there's not a high enough in size Correct. for both to have made it in both Correct. just because of the math score. Yes. Yeah, and so, that's, so that means, in, which reflects that, you know, less, a very small percentage of black and Latino students met the standard for math. And and just another thing to consider as you're interpreting the math is to remember that the focus is on students who took the state assessment in either algebra one, algebra two, or geometry. And so we have we may have high percentages of students taking algebra one um, in our early uh, high school or middle school, but as a district we typically don't do the algebra two or geometry assessment for the state just because of the numbers and the timing. And so that's also a factor for mm -hmm. the math column because again, the only opportunity really for our students is the state assessment, which is the MCAP, the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, algebra one. Okay, Councilman May. 
And I think you're um, uh, nudging again at what you mentioned before, which I'm about to mention again about the SAT, that we pay for that in the 11th grade. So right. really that's a parameter that for a, a large uh, group of our students is not going to be relevant because why would you bother to pay for it in 10th grade if you can you know, take it for free in 11th grade? Now there may be some students for whom finances are not an object uh, who are taking it in the 10th grade and maybe then they are qualifying under these under these standards maybe. But but by and large, SAT is, pre is pretty much off the list here in terms of what we're really using to determine proficiency. So we lost ACT, we lost SAT, um, and so we've, the, the pool is very much shrunk, even more so than it appears on paper. Yes, and just historically, I mean, for many school districts, taking the SAT in 11th grade is, the, is that's the typical it's grade level that you take yeah. it. And so again, you know, just spoiler alert, that was some of the advocacy when the um, state did their inquiry and um, feedback around what should some of the measures be, and PSAT was one that I put in there, but we'll come to that a bit mm -hmm. later. Um, and so uh, now I will turn it back to uh, Dr. Floyd to share more on the Identify Blueprint metrics. Thank you so much. I'm so appreciative of the questions. I've had the opportunity to share that data slide with a variety of stakeholders, with business leaders, with post-secondary partners at Montgomery College, universities at Shady Grove, central service leaders, school-based leaders, and it requires that we ask questions and we do a deeper dive so that we understand what we're looking at. To just show the data, it's concerning. It's, we have to add context to it. And so you basically, Council Member Meek and, and Council Member Joando, you've asked a lot of the questions that we have had to answer for our stakeholders. When we're looking and placing this in context, we have to look not only at the measure, but the approach our students take towards the measure. So we, let's, or Dr. Addison shared the number of interim measures that were in place. We don't get the park. The park was replaced by MCAP. To your point, SAT is not something that students take in grade 10. So SAT is crossed out. So we're primarily looking at the MCAP, the English 10 and the Algebra 1. So if you have teenagers or if you've met a teenager, if you know a teenager, when we're asking them to take a test, they want to know why. They want to know if it counts. And so we, we go through the conversation that no, it does not count or it does not impact, rather, your grade in English or math. It is not on your transcript. And you don't have to get a passing score in order to graduate. The state graduation requirement is that students take it. And so they take it. They participate. And it becomes a matter of compliance more so than a measure of performance. So the reality is we do have many students who are, we often tell them to do something and they do their very best at whatever we ask them to do. So in that data, we have students who participated, they tried their very best and they did well. Mixed in with the majority who participated, um, tried their best and did not do well, along with those who participated, did not try their best, did not do well, and was not concerned about doing well because poor performance is of no consequence to our students. And, and just like we um, give our effort, our time, and our attention to that which we value, so do they. So it becomes a matter of equating participation to graduation. So when we're looking at the data, we have to share it. We have to report this data to the state. But we also need to make sure everyone understands what it represents and what it does not. So there is a reality that these are the facts, our students participated, but we have to understand, at least in this scenario, there's a difference between facts and truth, and we have to differentiate between the two. So to get to more accurate data. So tell us the truth. <laughs> to get to more accurate data, what we did, um, Chairperson, is go back to the legislation to look at the definition, and the next slide provides that for us. So setting the measure aside, when we're looking at the blueprint legislation, students are deemed to be college and career ready if they have the requisite literacy in English and math that's needed to be successful in a first year college credit bearing course at a Maryland community college. It's a narrow definition, but that's the gold, that's the standard in the legislation. So with this definition in mind, we only needed to go to Montgomery College to get more accurate or information as it relates to where our students are. And the next slide provides us with that data. The, these are the assessments that Montgomery College uses. They don't use the MCAT. 
they use these data to, to determine if students have those requisite academic skills to be successful. And this is data that we have in our database. So before they graduate, because the goal per blueprint is by grade 10 or before graduation, we are able to pull data to, data to determine more accurately and truthfully where our students are prior to their departure. So to illustrate that point, we provided the next slide so that you can see when we're looking at our seniors prior to their graduation, because to council member makes point, students aren't taking the SAT, the Occupacer, the ACT in grade 10. So we're looking at what's happening with our current 12th graders mid-year in their 12th grade year. The yellow shows using the interim measures that 36% of our students are deemed not college ready or ready and the majority are not. But if we look at the standards and the measures that are used by Montgomery College, we see that almost 80% of students are actually deemed college and career ready based on the definition and the goal per the blueprint legislation. So this provides a more accurate reflection of where our students are when we're talking about the definition of college career readiness per the blueprint legislation. And, and it's not perfect. There are still students in the 21% who are deemed not college career ready by that definition that I'm sure we would consider as being college and career ready. Students in CTE are not considered. Students going to the military are not considered. So there's some shortcomings in this. Nevertheless, when we're looking strictly at the definition per blueprint, strictly at the measures that are used to determine if they actually are per Montgomery College, we see a different scenario than what we've seen previously. I shared earlier that the state did make the decision to um, go in a different direction, looking at the empirical study recommendations and some feedback, and I'm going to actually pass it back to Dr. Addison to share more details about the measures that we will be using going forward. Now, so as Dr. Floyd shared, there was an empirical research study um, based on AIR, the American Institutes of Research, that uh, MSDE hired. And as part of uh, the study, this slide shows you the level of engagement and the feedback that they solicited to support a recommendation for where we landed as it relates to um, college and career ready standard, the more permanent standard. And uh, a number of us in MCPS are in the number on this slide because we definitely took the opportunity to ensure that our voice was included in terms of what should be identified as um, standards. Next slide, please. Oh, you're there. All right, so um, as part of their feedback survey, what you can see on the left-hand side for that uh, horizontal bar chart are a number of measures listed down the left-hand side, which were options, and you can select more than one option as part of it. And um, what you will notice is overall high school GPA kind of ranked at the top in terms of what though, um, what was identified by many of us who completed that feedback survey. And so as you look down the left-hand column, you'll see things such as Algebra one course grade, PSAT, ACT, um, completing an AP IB course. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see some where the numbers were pretty low, but just gives you an idea of what were some other measures that were recommended um, as part of the feedback opportunity that was engaged. Next slide, please. So here's where we are going. Here on this slide is the new Blueprint CCR um, standard. And just for clarity, the visual represents the same thing. So the state pushed out two versions or two visuals of what is recommended. I prefer the left, so I'm going to speak to the left because I feel like it's just a cleaner yeah, the right. view. <laughs> so the right works for somebody, following the flow chart doesn't always work for everyone, so I'll focus on the left. And what you will notice is there are two options. Option one, um, which the first part is the high school GPA of 3.0 or higher. So that feedback from the previous slide, you see they took that in consideration. There was a high number of individuals who said high school GPA should be a factor. So that is one of the factors that are included in option one for the college and career ready standard. And um, in addition to be able to meet option one, a student must also demonstrate math mastery 
either, again, the state assessment, that, that's the OR side, the Algebra one state assessment still remains, or a student can earn a grade of C or higher in an Algebra one course. So that's option one. The um, shift, the addition, I would say, is in addition to the Algebra um, one state assessment, a student also has to have a GPA of three point higher. 3.0 or higher. So that's coupled together. You can't do, you can't have a 2.5 and have a 3 or higher on the state assessment. You would not meet this option. The second option um, is focused on, again, state assessments, and it's the, it's essentially the previous CCR interim measure. You meet the English language arts 10, grade 10 or higher state assessment, and you meet the expectation for the Algebra 1 state assessment. So again, there's this and measure which basically says you have to do both in order to be designated as college and career. Can I, can I ask a, and if you need to get back to me or if it's a rabbit hole question, let me know, but when I look at this, it seems to me that if there were concerns about grade inflation, mm. that through option one, you could, through the local uh, you know, school district, LEA, you could inflate your grades and, and qualify because it's the GPA is obviously based on what the grades are in, at the district level and the A, B, and C in Algebra 1 is also based on the grade level, grades given at the district, you know, as opposed to the state tests, which are a little more objective, which you can also qualify under. But so do you share that concern? Uh, you know, where in, do you agree with my assessment of the assessment? So um, I would say that what you raise is, is definitely something that we have to factor in in terms of the implications. And um, interestingly enough, we, you know, I would say we tend to be uh, a bit ahead of the curve, but kind of how we look at data for our local accountability metrics and MCPS aligns to this. So we, so for example, in our pathway to college and career readiness, we were looking, we are looking for students to graduate MCPS with a GPA of 3.0 or higher. Um, for our evidence of learning for classroom grades, we want students to earn a C or higher. Yes, there is an opportunity for some to um, uh, potentially inflate grades, but that's why the, that's the benefit of multiple measures because it essentially is, is um, to balance out where you would see that. So yes, for yes and and no. But where's the balancing out here? I'm just talking so about this it. is and that's the other piece. Yeah, we um, we didn't determine this. The right. state determined okay. this. So it, it does make it a bit challenging. And I'll pass it to Dr. Floyd to kind of speak to some of this as well. I just wanted to add to what Dr. Addison has already shared in response to your question. The American Institute um, for Research did a in-depth study, and one of the points that they brought out, even in recommending this, is that we needed to look at GPA, how it was determined across the state, particularly for the reason that you shared. So it, it is in the recommendation. So there's more work to do There's on more that. work to be done. Yeah. It is definitely on the radar of the state and in the recommendation from the empirical study. Because I've, I've, I've seen and heard from students, like on both ends of that, of this spectrum, uh, mm -hmm. that they're worried that their GPA is not going to be taken as seriously by some colleges and, and institutions of higher education because of uh, what's happening. So it's just, and then on the other end, obviously, there's, you know, kids want, there's students who are happy that, you know, they their grades are higher, but again, but I don't think none of us want to be doing that if it doesn't mean that, right, of right. course, so we need to just be, so we would obviously participate in any state study related to that. Is there anything planned? Is on the the, there was a recommendation included in the report that okay. was submitted to the state, so okay. it is my belief that they're going to follow through on these recommendations because yeah. there's great variability not only within school districts, school to school, but well, across yeah. districts within the state. So it is on their radar, and I do believe that they're going to follow Are we doing anything on our own? right now on not that. Outside not outside of MSDE in the that. study. Okay. All of this is under, we will be participating sure. because they've done a great job in soliciting feedback and input about all of these recommendations and the processes. Got so it. we have been very vocal and we continue to do so. That's well, something to come back to at some point that, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Continue. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm slowing you down. Maybe no, no, actually this was up. the last slide before discussion. So we're <laughs> right where we need to be for this part. 
Yes, Ms. McGuire. That, that would conclude the college and career, career readiness portion um, if the committee wants to shift to the snapshot uh, updates on math and literacy. See where we are in math and literacy. Yeah, let's, do you have any questions on the college? Let's get the snapshot. Let's go. And thank you. This was, this was, thank you. This was great. We're going to come back to it. This was really helpful. And uh, thank you for updating us. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll see you at dual enrollment. Yes, sir. Send us a date. Ms. Hazel. Thank you. So we are going to provide you a very brief update on literacy and mathematics. And as Ms. McGuire said, we will be presenting to the MCPS Board of Education tomorrow on the evidence of learning data. Um, so we'd like to be able to, to share with them first. Um, so we're getting old. They're getting new stuff. We're getting old stuff. I got we'll it. give it to you as soon as we finish with them. <laughs> I see um, Board Member Harris in the back. That's the way it should go. That's fine with me. Yeah, so as soon as uh, we, we share with our board, then we will certainly um, provide you all an update. Um, so we are here just to give a, a brief update on um, literacy, particularly with our primary grades. Um, uh, kindergarten through grade two, you all know that we have moved to structured literacy or, or what you may know as science of reading. So we want to provide you an update on how that is going, as well as mathematics grades three through five. Um, we had some uh, supports through our budget uh, last year with coaching and, and other things, and we want to be able to provide an update to you on how those things are, are going. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Logan to present that information. Thank you, Ms. Hazel. Um, so again, uh, we're going to start with literacy grades kindergarten through uh, second grade. Go to the next slide. So over the past three years, uh, as you know, MCPS has shifted the way that we teach reading and writing to a structured literacy approach, and, and the reminder is there just about what that has meant for us. It's been a, a, a real huge shift, um, not only in mindset, but in instruction and just the way that we think about teaching students how to read. Um, and we began, as I said, in the year 21-22. The shifts we made were informed by a body of research known as the science of reading. And this science of reading research tells us how the brain learns to read and write and how proficient reading and writing develops for our students. And so the research emphasizes that reading and writing instruction should be explicit, systematic, and cumulative. And so what we have done is really spent the last three years not only studying what that means for us, but spending a lot of time with our teachers on professional learning, ensuring that they there is an understanding and we're really seeing in our classroom those shifts where key skills are, are taught directly, modeled clearly and explained by the teacher. Instruction follows a planned and logical sequence that goes from simple to complex for our students. And where we're connecting new learning to old learning and especially where we're having this continuous um, opportunity for checking for understanding using those assessment measures one that which we're going to really look at and, and, and talk a little bit more detail today but informal measures in the classroom too to be able to monitor progress along the way um, and we're really seeing some progress with our students um, with this shift in the early grades we go to the next slide so as part of our shift to structured literacy, we've had to move away from some common literacy practices. And again, this shift, I can't emphasize enough how, how much of a shift it's been for our teachers because it's, it's been asking them to change the way that uh, many of us have learned to teach students how to read. And uh, based on the research, this, some of these practices have asked teachers to shift to ensuring that phonics instruction is uh, systematic and explicit, that we're using decodable text that we've been able to provide for our teachers to provide instruction, that students are receiving targeted small group instruction and really rethinking what that looks like for our students using these new resources, um, the diagnostic tools again, which I mentioned, and then the last piece of the puzzle I'm really excited to share we now have in place. Really, it's about implementing a content-rich reading curriculum. So on March 19th, MCPS was approved by our Board of Education to begin the adoption process for a new elementary English language arts curriculum. We've adopted uh, the 
core knowledge language arts curriculum, CKLA, which is very much aligned with the science of reading. Research that I just described and with our shift to structured literacy, we're really excited um, for all that it will um, allow us to continue to do, reinforce what we've been doing, but really just provide that last piece for our teachers for that ongoing instruction and the resources that we believe will be the, the missing piece of the puzzle for our teachers in the classroom. And that'll begin implementation next school year. One last note is that the shifts that we've made in literacy also align with the resolution that was passed this past January by the state of Maryland, mandated that uh, literacy instruction in, in, in Maryland um, will align to the science of reading, which we are already there. So here we are, just to share again, just a brief snapshot, and the data that you see here is representative of some of our fall data. We are seeing growth with our students in early literacy reading instruction, um, and we're really excited about it. So the data here is based on the dynamic indicator of, of basic early literacy skills, the Dibbles assessment, which is the tool that we use to monitor how our students are doing with their early literacy skills. Um, and, and here we can see an increase of the percent of students meeting the benchmark from the beginning of this current school year, where we were um, compared to where we ended last school year. So at the beginning of the school year, 56% of our students in grades K to 2 were performing at or above the benchmark, uh, were, and now we're 5% higher than we were last school year. Um, and we're seeing even more growth. So just a little preview of what you're going to be able to see Because you've got some stuff that you know that you're, that, you're, you're, you know, that's you're just holding a little preview. Okay. Um, it's continuing to go in the right direction. It's, so just it's so heading in the right direction. So just so I understand this, the 22-23, you take the 32 and 19, so that's, uh, what, 51? Percent, so you went up five percent. Yes, between the beginning. Actually, yeah. it's more than that because we yes. have other data, but we're heading, that trend is continuing. And that's really what we're looking for. And we're looking for that incremental growth over time. And this is showing overall for grades K to two. But what we're really excited about is that we're also seeing that incremental growth for students in our racial and ethnic groups, mm -hmm. as well as our service groups as well. And we really attribute it to the changes and the shifts that we've made um, in, in, in our instructional approach, for sure. Um, and so this, again, is just a, a snapshot that the work that we're putting in place is working. We're seeing in our data um, through the Dibbles assessment. We're also seeing it in the classroom. So I think that's a really important data point to just mention. Um, I talked about the mindset shift, but when we go into our schools, when we talk to our principals and to our teachers, we can see it happening. We can see them putting into place everything that we're providing through professional learning. We see the small group instruction. We can hear the students talking about the reading that's reflective of the teacher's instruction. And that's also just really reassuring that the professional learning that we're providing is, is making a difference as well for our students. Just want to pause, uh, I think, because you were this was your last slide on the you were going to go to math, right? Uh, yeah. So mm -hmm. Councilor Mike has a question. Yeah, I mean, you, and you have touched on this a little bit with the qualitative uh, assessment that you can do moving through the schools and the classrooms, um, but you said that you attributed it, uh, the improvements to the change shifts in instruction, and I just wanted to know if there was an additional why for that, for how you're assessing that. Oh, absolutely. For the shifts in instruction? For uh, attributing the shifts, uh, the improvement in the scores to the shifts in what's happening with instruction. Oh, absolutely. So. Yes, so with K-2, we have, there have been some changes with materials and resources. So um, not only with professional learning, there's been a lot of professional learning that we've provided to all of our teachers in grades K-2. Um, so that's certainly a factor, um, as well as some instructional resources. Re really great reading is one um, that our teachers were provided um, that uh, is very explicitly helping them to be able to provide this sort of explicit phonics instruction that has helped um, to, to attribute to some of the growth that we're seeing as well. And we also were able to hire literacy coaches as mm -hmm. a result of some Maryland LEAD grant funds. Um, and so we, we uh, recommended to be able to move some of those positions into the local budget for the future, but uh, those positions did support this work as well. And there's, there's one last piece. Um, 
I will add to that, it's the work that we've been able to do with our reading specialists. So um, I think that was two years ago, the, the budget was put in place to ensure that each and every elementary school had a full-time reading specialist. We get to spend time with those reading specialists every month. They are the, the reading, they're our extension of that reading support in the building to be with those grade level teams during planning, to provide support in the classrooms. They get the direct professional learning from us centrally, but they're the on-the-ground support in the schools. And so um, that's another piece that I think has been highly effective as well. That's right. Um, yeah, just want to, the more we're, and this is hard to do because there are, there's multiple variables at play here because we're trying to make improvements and, and, and you are, um, but the more you're able to bring us some kind of data comparisons or some kind of analysis that shows we think that these improvements are attributable to these particular interventions, these are the interventions that are most effective uh, because as we're making, uh, you know, having the budget conversations to be able to say we should be spending more on this compared to this, maybe they're both working, but this one working super well and this one's only helping a little bit so let's fund you know this one more um, the more you have ways to be able to kind of break down what is working the best mm -hmm. um, that's going to be really helpful yeah. thank you I just want to double tap that and dr. Addison stepped out but you, I'm sure she can you'll touch she'll hear it you can tell her just that even if it's not a longitudinal you know statistically verified study there's there's there could be more formative or smaller ways to, to suss that out of like what inner and realizing we're in finite research, look, I'd love to, I'd love to double the school system budget personally, right? You know, but the, I don't know if taxpayers were ready to do that, right? But so we have to really try to hone in on the reading specialist versus the curriculum versus the uh -huh. professional learning, and 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 then obviously the board, I think, will benefit from that level of you know information and feedback as we're really trying to laser focus on math and literacy. Uh, what is really moving the needle the most? And it, the answer might be there, you know, but we should at least attempt to suss it, you know, to Absolutely. parse it out. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Alvarado. Yeah, I'll be brief. I know we're way over, but um, so we fund a lot of nonprofit community based organizations that provide additional layers of support, which, you know, are obviously independent of MCPS, but part of this very important ecosystem. George B. Thomas, you know, there are many others. And you don't have to answer right now, but I'd be curious as to from, and you may not have even had a chance to analyze, but it would be helpful if you did at some point. What are some of those extracurricular, other additional ancillary programs that you believe are helping um, and contributing and providing additional resources in addition to what we're getting in the classroom that are contributing to success? or? Conversely, are there other extracurricular activities that are MCPS sponsored in the summer um, or during spring breaks uh, or other breaks that you think are working and that um, you're referring children to and families to? Uh, I'd love to hear more about what those success stories look like and that will help us in our budget deliberations. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, let's, do, we'll let's speed slide. through math. Yeah, absolutely. And we're gonna do exactly what you just asked us to do for math, because we're gonna talk about our instructional math coaches. We can go to the next slide, please. So just very briefly, um, there are two key focus areas that you see here at the center of our pre-K-12 comprehensive math plan. Um, staff must deeply know the math and they must deeply know their students. So two of the action items of the plan to help us achieve these goals include partnering with instructional leaders to ensure conditions exist at the schools for teachers to plan collaboratively and discuss student data regularly, and then building capacity of teachers through professional learning to engage in curriculum study, um, as, as well as professional learning to deepen their understanding of the grade level standard. One of the key tools for actualizing this plan is the deployment of our central um, instructional math coaches to 33 elementary schools. Coaches have a very clear and specific focus for working with the grade level team they're assigned to in each school. They're, they are a differentiated resource as they're assigned to 33 schools. They build staff capacity to improve preparing to teach by studying and doing the math with teachers. And they hold teachers accountable for maintaining the pace of the daily grade level instruction. So we appreciate the, the 
budget from the county council as well as our board of education for these instructional coaches which will continue to next school year um, for the same allocation that we had during this school year we have seen tremendous um, gains in the schools that have been supported by these coaches and we're going to talk about some of that data right now those are that was in the base budget now that wasn't extra funded yeah. that's correct yeah we can go to the next slide so with this slide, so let's explain what you see here. So here you'll notice that for our school teams working with math coaches, the number of students performing at the lowest level decreases for the measures of academic progress in mathematics. That's our MAP-M assessment, which means that our students with the greatest needs are showing more learning and showing proficiency based on this data point. So we're reducing the number of students who are performing at the lowest level at those grade levels for teams that are working with coaches at those schools. So this is a, this is the students represented in raw numbers. Yes. That are performing that were performing at the lowest levels. Right below the benchmark. For below them. the benchmark. So it's the, this is apples to apples. The same students. Same students. From fall to winter. Yes. Based with the intervention of the math coach yes and you're seeing a deep the reason the green bar is a good thing is because you saw a decrease in those students right so in the fall the gray bar shows how many students were below the benchmark very well below and then in the winter the teal shows how many students are still below same so year. you can this see in the same year. year this is this school year this school year fall to winter fall this school year this school year fall to winter so between august and now or august and january yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, it's pretty that's, significant. That's, that's, a, that's a good drop, uh, Councilmember Mike. Uh, that's great. I'd love to see it. That's that's really exciting news. Um, and on the data piece, though, in order to show that this is due to the intervention, right? We would need a comparison of the schools with the or the students with the who have the benefit of that intervention compared to a comparison group without the intervention. Um, because if these drops are happening everywhere, obviously, then uh, you know we can't tell that from this. So, like ideally, I think I would see like the first bar would be the difference between the gray and the blue bar. That would actually be represented in the first bar, and then we would have a second bar that had a comparison group of students without the uh, intervention. Uh, so we can compare those bars. Now I'm going to get, I mean these are really dramatic numbers and I'm going to guess that um, you have looked at those comparisons yourself and yes. so you know that the comparison yes. is strong um, but like that's what the, yeah that's what we, we let's show that. Yeah and, and we can certainly get that for you and we are seeing that. We're seeing that not only are the are we seeing that but we're seeing it a much faster rate at the schools with coaches as well it's really remarkable what we're seeing and we're happy to share that with you um and and we're and, and the public i think that's and, what the, and the for, public like, as well all these interventions that we want to put more money into like we need to really have you defend those vocally you're seeing these great things let's make sure it's very very clear um to us to the public uh you know what we're funding and why and if we there's not enough funding but it would be really really great and we would like let's just be very honest with the public about that as well absolutely absolutely Okay, we can go to the next slide. So similar to the previous slide, these data show growth in student uh, performance as well. Um, these are the same teams of students whose teachers work every week with an instructional math coach. Now you're looking at the data disaggregated by racial and service groups. However, this time the data point is the required district assessment. So before you were looking at the, the MAP M, and now you're looking at the district assessment, which is grounded in the math standards that are assessed by the state of Maryland at the end of each school year. So different data point, but we're seeing some similar re results. And if you look across our, our racial, um, ethnic, and service groups here, again, st uh, starting with the students with the greatest need, these data show a decline in the students who are underachieving. Um, greater improvement on the district assessments and the grade level standards should predi predicate greater improvement on the Maryland State assessments that are coming. And as you can see in every student group by race and by service, fewer and fewer students are in the lower performing band. Yeah, and, and just one of the things would be great when we go over this again, when we come back with the new data, mm -hmm. to have the 
comparison that Councilmember Mink mentioned, so the schools that do not have the math coach mm -hmm. and what their rates have been in the same time period, and then also the other racial subgroups, namely, obviously the only one you're really missing here is our white and Asian students. Right. Um, but to see, just to, What's so we have the whole the picture, because picture. Yeah. I think that's just really important to right. show. I believe you that you've looked at it before yes. you brought it here today, but I do think it's important to Councilmember makes point to have it here, but this is this is significant in a matter of months. Yeah, absolutely, and just just for the purposes of a of a quick snapshot, and I, I, we definitely will will do that for next time. Um, it's just a, a a really brief, high level way to show you that these coaches are making an impact. We see it. We've been tracking this closely all throughout the entire school year. It's just been a matter of months, right, since the beginning of the school year. This is the first year of implementation. We're hearing it from the schools. The data is showing it. We're seeing it in the teachers' uh, practices, in their planning, in their curriculum study. It's been a really great investment. And hopefully we will see it on the state assessment data that we looked at in this committee Absolutely. Uh, I don't know, like late last year, that was troubling, right, for, especially for this population, the, the elementary age, black and Latino students in particular. We right. expect to see this translate into higher scores on those state tests. Obviously, we don't have that yet, right? So right. When will, that, when will we get that? Uh, that would be in the fall. We should have that. Okay, great. So we'll go great. to the next slide. So just to, to briefly wrap up, so overall, um, our findings here indicate that with certain conditions and, and expectations for planning, instruction, and progress monitoring, when those conditions are met, student uh, performance improves. Um, and so we're, we're seeing that. That's true for both literacy and mathematics. When the planning and curriculum study the right pieces with the instruction, whether that be the new curriculum that we're going to be having for elementary ELA or the differentiated resources that we talked about for mathematics are in place, as well as the progress monitoring. That's where we see the growth for our students. And um, we're just going to continue to monitor our data in this way. We look forward to coming back to provide you with more updates as well. Thank you very much. This was great um, and, and very heartening to end. I'm glad we ended on this and to see the, the upward trajectory for literally in the last few months for many of our students at the elementary level. Um, so uh, we've, I think we've given some hopefully constructive feedback on ways to measure and things that you, I think it sounds like you're already doing, but to just display what's happening. Um, so uh, colleagues, if, if no questions. We will, uh, our next session is on the 22nd, uh, where we will be covering uh, a number of items uh, related to the, our, the budget, um, and just really appreciate the work you're doing and everyone sticking with us till 1230. So with that, we are adjourned.